TV Sports app. TV AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent modes. Half past seven on this Tuesday morning on OTB AM brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. We've reached the halfway point of the World Cup in Qatar in terms of games, not in terms of days. Really special treat for you on this Tuesday morning. Adrian Barry. Is alongside me. Morning, Adrian. How are things? You know how are you getting on? Keeping well. Keeping well. Can't we haven't. Believe it's halfway there. It's mad, isn't it? Same. That's uh, it's. It, we've, we're now at the point where we have games. Two games at three o'clock. Two games at seven o'clock. As the group stages draw to a conclusion. How are you? Um, how are you finding the whole thing so far? Like it's. It's. I don't think we've had you on or spoken to you as much. No, since. I haven't been on. I haven't been on. Um, so yeah, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of spent the first few days watching everything that went. Yeah. Like every ball that was kicked. I was watching live matches. In the background, yeah. Um, highlights, you know, consuming everything I could, and then I just thought this is uh, not sustainable. It's too much. It's just too much. And also, I was interested for commander. Like, I'm definitely the sort of person who consumes these tournaments in a way that, like, two days later, somebody will go. Oh, do you remember when Japan beat Germany there a few days ago? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. daily. Some vague recollection of that. It's just with that onslaught of constant games yeah. all the time. I just find it hard to keep on top of everything. I feel like oh, in your subconscious, then you will remember it. Those those surprise ah, notes for all time. You will when the, when when the the, the replay comes on and it takes split second, and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, no. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Which well, sure, the crappy quiz last week. One of the questions I got right on on my way to to a victory was uh, who did France lose to in the opening game of the 2002 World Cup? Don't, uh, Senegal came to me, mm. but don't ask me where. Did it you came got from. it like a bullet in fairness. Like, to you, that was a, it came from subconscious. Very impressive. But that'll be a, that'll be a question. The crappy quiz in twenty years time. Yeah. You know who did Ger- Germany lose yeah. to in the opening game? Yeah. Japan and people will remember. It's been good and like the the little upsets that have happened along the way definitely yeah. helped. Like I love you, it's the first one that happened. I was like, yes, this is great. It felt to me that was a land in the World Cup. Yeah, where these little sort of upsets have started to happen. Give me more. Yeah, the, exactly. The yeah. Asian teams and the African teams have kind of made it. Like you know the likes of Morocco. The Saudi Arabian result against Argentina. Argentina yeah. I mean, even like South Korea performing well as well. Like, Ecuador just... holding Netherlands. Like that's they're they're all they're all uh, benchmarks for the World Cup that you need to have. Yeah. Now I will say I like to see that during the group stages, and then I like to for that to finish at that point. Really? Ah, yeah. I I think when you get to the latter stages of the World Cup, you need the better teams, the bigger teams. That's that's where I'm at. I, I, the upsets can stop there. Like I don't the the Greece 2004 stuff is not really. You wouldn't like to see Morocco win the World Cup, no? I mean, no, 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 no. You want to see the best teams, don't you? Like that's the that's the like. Look, if Morocco, what's your dream final on paper? Obviously, like re- um, disregarding the potential paths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The knock-ons. Um, at the minute, it's probably Brazil and France. Just the way that the way the tournament has gone so far, the form of Mbappe is just off the charts. He's what can you say about him that hasn't been said already? Uh, he's unbelievable. <laughs> like in a way that, like, I'm not even sure from a club point of view or regular France games point of view, he's a very good player. But geez, yeah. we're just seeing, I think, uh, Mbappe next gen. At the yeah. minute, he's he's off the charts. So I think because he's so good, because France are going really well, they're always a really good team to watch. Anyway, they're without all those players. Would it be good for us? If France ended up winning the World Cup, I mean, it might not be, but maybe Some France are suggesting there. it would be, as in like a bit of a hangover for the Euro 2024 qualifiers. Oh, I don't no. really know if that exists. No, By the time that they, those games come around in March, I mean, it's a different. No, it's proof that they're an unbelievable team if yeah. they win the World Cup, and that's that would be my biggest concern. What about you? Yeah, uh, like... I'd love to see the Dutch do a little bit of a run. Mm. People are kind of sleeping on the Dutch a little bit. Mm. I don't know. Like they're, they're, there's not much talk about them, and they, 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 do, they do have a very good team. Van Hal is an excellent manager. Cody Gakpo is playing really well. Put himself in the in the transfer window, I think, for January. United. Well, like I mean, United are going to be linked with every they player. Are every the single player that comes up. Like yeah. Enner Valencia is probably being linked with United now. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. any, any player who scores a World Cup goal is like, oh, he's going to United. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I, it's hard to know. I, I, I'd love to see. I'd love to see the Dutch do something. Um, Brazil were my shout at the start of the World Cup, unsurprisingly. I think most people had Brazil. Argentina, like they looked a lot better against Mexico um, compared to the Saudi game, so I don't know. They, they'll probably come good as well. But yeah, England, England, France, I think, is a potential pairing in a, in a quarter final, mm. which, which could be interesting. Be crack. England, anybody, let's face it. That's, that's, you know, even tonight, like, I mean, <laughs> they could, well, yeah. it's such a shame that there isn't a bit more on it that the Welsh let us down a bit, but um, 
if the if if you know the the unlikely scenario that uh, if if Iran and um, Iran, I should say to pronounce it absolutely Iran, properly of from the uh, press conference yesterday. Yeah. Iran uh, and uh, USA draw, then then Wales are out. And um, uh, sorry, if they draw, then they have to, they can win by four goals to yeah. progress the next stage. It's just it's all very unlikely. It's hashtag permutations day yeah. in the in the World Cups we've started. So yeah, that's that's probably the group B, like England four points, Iran, Iran. We going with Iran? Iran, Iran. Yeah, three points. USA two points. Wales one. That's yeah. Like England, obviously strongest position. So, as you say, if they avoid a four-goal defeat against Wales today, they will qualify. Win will guarantee England top spot. If they draw and fit, they can still finish top unless Iran beat the United States. Ah, oh, look, there's too many. There's too many. I think it's England and the US to go through. Basically. Yeah, the USA Iran yeah, matches so is fascinating. Unlikely. Like, yeah, even oh, just yeah. the whole off-pitch stuff yeah. in, in advance of it, and the what the US removing the Islamic Republic symbol from the Iran flag, and they put the, did they did they remove it? I'm, I didn't see the image itself. Yeah, I don't, I don't the, know what there, there wasn't an Iran flag going around that had the word women. Or woman written across the middle of it in right. solidarity with women's rights in Iran, which yeah, is obviously yeah. a major talking point, um, which felt to me to be a fairly legitimate thing. That was a monster flag that was in was in uh, one of the, it was at one of the Iran games, um, and in fact I saw I was reading a thing yesterday where there were where there's um, some Iranian women who've been going to some of the World Cup games are um, concerned that there are spotters looking at the TV to find because you're not allowed to go to a game as a woman right in, Fran- in Iran. And uh, that they're concerned that there will be Jeez. action taken or whatever when they get home. So it was, uh, yeah, that's what you're dealing with, like I mean, yeah, madness. Um, that's probably the game I'm looking forward to most. I can't wait for Wales England as well. But the uh, I'm surprised that it took this long for a protester to invade the pitch. Like during mm. the Portugal Uruguay match, I had uh, fella ran on with I think it was he had the rainbow flag and and solidarity Ukraine, from Ukraine. Ukraine on the front. And was it L- LGBTQ on the back? There was some. He, he had women's rights. Respect for Iranian women was another one of his messages. Right, okay. He, he was covering all the bases, of course. Yeah. But um, I, it, it, you need that again, like for a World Cup, Shane. Like it's funny because, like the, I've been to a couple of these, uh, the Euros, twelve and sixteen, mm. and like when you get there, there is a sense of Disneyland about everything. There's a smell of fresh paint everywhere you go. Like yeah, yeah. not even just around the stadiums, like the cities. Everywhere gets a lick of paint yeah. before these things come in, like <laughs> literally and, and exactly. Yeah. And like it's all this, like you know, the branding wrap is everywhere, and like it's on the buses, it's on the metros, it's obviously around the stadiums, it's in the city centre. <laughs> there is a feel of walking around Disneyland at these things. This one feels just a little bit different. That actually, that 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 uh, I was going to call him a streaker. The pitch invader, like, was kind of one of the first things we were like, oh, this is the sort of thing that happens at a World Cup. You know, mm. like it's been it's been missing. I think a fair bit of that. Like you had the context. Remember over the first just before the tournament kicked off, you had all those weird things of these clearly non fans from the country that were supposed to be from. Yeah. Oh, you know, bizarre. Um, the English fans. Yeah. You know, singing "Football's Coming Home" in the wrong key was like <laughs> just it was all a bit weird. Like that was bizarre. Um, so and I don't know. It hasn't fully. And you're you're watching from afar, obviously, and you're mm. you're watching the coverage, and you're trying to sort of figure out or interpret exactly what it's like on the ground. Um, and I'm just not, just not sure. Like I was like I was reading Dan McDonald had his first kind of postcard from oh yeah from Qatar yesterday in the Irish Independent, and he was like he's very he's there a week, and he said he's he's there for three more, and he's still very much trying to gauge what he makes of the whole thing. Mm. And I think after another th- another three weeks, everyone covering the the tournament will be still trying to figure out well, what's. What is going on here? Because like, there's there's areas where there's holes in the ground and just the, the place just isn't ready. Mm. Like the metro is probably the 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 big legacy thing to come out of this for for Doha probably because that was only built for the World Cup. This legacy stuff, I oh, well, can't there's, get there's no football in legacy at all. It's like you know, surely London 2012 was the experience by which we all after that go. This yeah. legacy thing is a white elephant. It just makes it's of no significance at all. Yeah, and yeah. like, but even even the like, it will be. It will, look, it will be interesting to see once the all the you know once we get down to the last sixteen. Obviously, you've lost a whole pile of teams out of it, and yeah. then you're losing more teams. As you go. It certainly narrows the focus. Will we see more? Will the stadiums get a bit more full now or less full? Like, I mean, there's that's a been Brazil a match like yesterday. That's half. That's empty. You know, like, and they've probably sold tickets. They've probably sold whatever requirements. Um, but the the half empty stadiums at the World Cup is not a great look. Like no. I mean, you're watching that reeling in the years in twenty years time, going, what the hell was that all about? Yeah, why are there empty seats at the World uh, Cup? Doesn't make sense. Um, we did touch in the Portugal Uruguay game. Ronaldo oh, yeah. trying to steal Bruno Fernandes. What do you reckon? I mean, he didn't touch the ball, did he? Uh, Piers Morgan was tweeting uh, after the match. Well. Uh, it's a good friend, of course. Cristiano Ronaldo saying uh, he, uh, of course, touched it, and he shared a screen grab where it appeared to be flicking off a fibre of uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's uh, hair. 
I mean, the ball didn't move. Very, very hard. Richie Sadler put it best on the, the panel last night that I've I've seen it where he where he analysed it and said the if Ronaldo wasn't there, mm-hmm. his two take, takes were if Ronaldo wasn't there, the keeper then it. the keeper would have come out and made an easy save. But also, he didn't touch the ball. Fair. It's actually impossible to tell. And I'll tell you how much, how impossible it is to tell. If you look at the Irish Daily Mail this morning, right? On the back page, it says, pull the other Ron, right? And you've got a photograph here, and there's clearly, you may not be able to see it there, but I can tell you, a gap between the right. ball and his head, right? And the caption says, mind the gap, Ronaldo claims Portugal opener, but he didn't get a touch. That's the Irish Daily Mail back page. Yeah. Don't okay. go too far, right? Clear flick as mud. In, flick inside. In the same paper... The inside page, and you've got a photograph of Ronaldo's forelock glancing <laughs> the touch of the ball there, right? I mean, and the caption says, "Close call. Ronaldo appears to get a touch, but the technology disagreed." So I mean, that's that, same paper. that's it in a that's it in a nutshell. That kind but, of but I have to say, I mean, you see, the thing is, it's hard to separate your "I really don't want it to be his goal" yeah, from reality, which is most people's opinion. If that photograph. Real and photographs can't be. It ball could be gone past him a little bit there, and it looks like it's touching it, so it's really hard to tell. Uh, I heard somebody saying there's only one person who knows whether he's touched the ball or not, and it's Ronaldo. And in my view, you just can't trust him. <laughs> fair. I mean, that's a fair point. And I mean, I thought the fact that he didn't run off and do his whole Sue celebration yeah. was an indicator or that the, maybe I'm he was asleep like, celebration. Yeah, he didn't do it either. So you're like, uh, he's not sure that he scored this goal. If he was in any way a class act borrow the expression he wouldn't be walking off the pitch afterwards going oh you know touch me like you'd be you know you get all this nonsense about Ronaldo oh, he's a great leader he's you know amazing captain blah 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 Look, I, if he was walking off the pitch and he was all of those things he wouldn't be going up to Fernandez going oh it touched my head it touched my goal yeah. he'd be going I'm delighted for you man you're like this is brilliant the world stage <laughs> knowing of course Still, that the Dubious Goals Committee would have a look at this thing. Of course, I and there's decide. A Dubious Goals Committee at the World Cup. I would imagine so. They're going to have to be, because, I mean, that, yeah. to score the World Cup is huge. Like, as a, as a striker in Sunday League football later, and I can tell you, if I had done what Ronaldo did, I would be claiming Laying that goal. yourself down now, Shane. Come like, on, this is... I mean, I mean top-level yeah. stuff here. You're constantly dropping uh, Always dropping. of, like, Hannon. Yeah. Hannon got one goal in yeah, one Monaghan's 7-1 says... route of whoever. <laughs> <laughs> Damien on uh, YouTube says, the goal was scored by a Man U player. Which is a fair point. Well, uh, not, like not technically true. Well, Bruno Fernandez is a Manchester United player. I know, but like the Man- Manchester United uh, official Twitter account uh, did post after the game: uh, two assists in the first game, two goals in this one. That's Bruno. <laughs> 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 Which I mean, quality it's, trolling. It's quite clearly a dig at, at Cristiano Ronaldo, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was his goal. Um, but yeah, still. Portugal got the result and, and uh, moved, they moved on. So uh, here's what's coming up between uh, now and 10 a.m. this morning on OTP AM on this Tuesday morning. So we'll have uh, Kevin Gaban joining myself and Adrian very shortly at around 7.50 live from Qatar with his uh, views on last night's games and of course looking ahead to all the action today. Ian Corbett, the Limerick Joint Football Captain, will join us from around 10 past 8. Newcastle West with a, with a famous win in the Munster Club semi-final uh, last weekend. Tommy Rooney will be with us as well around 8, 8.35 this morning. Uh, the Football Pod had a really, really good uh, interview, an exclusive interview with the former male boss James Horan some uh, some great stuff out of that interview so Johnny, Tommy will uh, bring us up to speed with that 8.50 the sports pages with John Duggan John will bring us his greatest World Cup 11 of his lifetime so the uh, best 11 players he feels that have played in a World Cup finals uh, the tournament that is in his lifetime so if you have any thoughts on your own have a think YouTube comment all the rest 10 past uh, 9 Adrian Mullen uh, last year's Kilkenny hurling captain uh, of course Bally Hill star as well will join us as well on the line and uh, from half past nine, Pat Nevin will be with us. Um, also, so that's uh, what's coming between my, uh, now and 10 a.m. with myself and Adrian on OTB AM. Um, Adrian, you were watching the interview with, uh, the latest interview Piers Morgan has done with um, Richard Keyes and Andy Gray, uh, two pals of his, yeah. um, with a lovely Qatari backdrop. You can see the, the sun in the sideline. There's a, a screen grab of there for, uh, for people on, on the YouTube streams. Um, what did you make of this? Have you, seen, have you seen it all? I've seen a few clips from it. Yeah. I, uh, I found myself watching too much talk TV, to be honest with you, between the interview the other <laughs> week and uh, and last night. And he also had an interview, uh, appears with the CEO of the uh, World Cup uh, beforehand, which just felt as it was kind of missing a few of the important questions. But yeah, I sort of flicked over that. I don't know. It, there's like, 
there's a car crash nature to flicking on an interview like that. I think he's aware of that as well, Piers Morgan, like mm. that, that there's a rubbernecker aspect to it. And I was definitely um, in that category last night just to see what the hell these two... Because like they've obviously... I, you don't consume too much of them anymore. They pop up every now and then on social media when they've said something absolutely outrageous on their, um, on their channel. and Which is every week. Most weeks. Um, first TV interview in British media in 10 years, it was flagged up. This is, you know, this is going to be an extraordinary reveal. I kind of have expected it to be the full, you know, if he knocked 90 minutes out of Ronaldo, he'd surely knock an hour out of Keys and Grey. But no, I was left very disappointed in that front. It was How long was it? 15, 20 minutes, maybe something uh. like that. It was, um, they had to make room before Alexi Lalas came in to, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hang around for that. I couldn't, uh, I'd had my fill at that point. But, um, it was it was uh, it was a bizarre one, and it was like why why have you decided to sit down with me now? It was the sort of opening gambit, and you kind of expected that to set the tone, and it kind of did because it was basically a bed of sand. It was like you know, well, we agree with a lot of what you have to say, Piers, and it wasn't you know this wasn't an own goal. You know, once you asked us to come in, were we definitely going to do it? You know, we had to give it some deep consideration, and it was like a pick around their lives, particularly around the time that they got sacked. Obviously, um, post their sexist comments and. Um, the mental anguish that they went through at that time and it seemed to particularly affect Andy Gray uh, very significantly and um, Keyes did say as well that he was uh, he was having struggles with his mental health at that time uh, there was clearly a big anger uh, Keyes was talking about you know I keep a back pocket full of anger for the un- un- unnamed people mm. who were clearly involved in this whole process when he um, when he departed. Um, and he retold all the detail around why he got sacked in the phone call uh, with the assistant referee the next day and, you know, how he had... I've heard the story, him tell the story about himself, reflecting amazingly on himself, about how, you know, they had not flagged up um, various mistakes that she had made in the first half of the game that they were that they were covering that day. Yeah. The fact that he's told that story in itself about uh, that I've seen about 20 times since, at least, like doesn't, again, sort of reflect amazingly, amazingly on the whole thing. And it's just as cringe, ultimately, was the main takeaway. The retelling of all that stuff was just as cringe as it was when he did it about a week after um, he got he got the boot. So, yeah, I didn't reveal a huge amount. It was like, you know, um, the both of them kind of saying, you know, we're not this caricature that we're portrayed to be while coming across like mm. exactly every, all the perceptions that you have of them yeah it's my main issue with them uh, and it's probably the same with the Ronaldo one is like Piers Morgan is not a is not a journalist anymore if he ever once was I mean the, the, the opening question to Ronaldo kind of summed it up as well he's like what was that you know, why are you here why, why are you doing the interview and Ronaldo's like because I really 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 like you mm. Piers like I really like you too oh yeah he's like they did everything but hug and kiss and it was like I mean it kind of similar in the Keys Grey when it's like he's facilitating people to tell their side of the story without challenging anything mm. so there's no challenging questions from Piers Morgan mm. on any interviews anymore No. Um, so it's kind of yeah, it's, it's hard to stomach them you'll, you'll still watch them as you say because sometimes the, the clips pop up in their box office and you're like mm. well I'm going to watch this Unfortunately, uh, you, yeah. can't, you can't help it. Well, I hope that that's uh, that's the last time I'm I'm drawn into that quarter. I, uh, you know, that, uh, Andy Gray. What what you know? Because so that comes up about the human rights abuses in in Qatar and their you know their their uh, treatment of women and gay people. Well, what could Qatar do better? Mm. More golf courses, guffaws, Andy Gray. It's like you know, just the lack of self awareness around that stuff is exactly, I think, why they're in the position they're in. Yeah. And you know, Keys, would you come back to the? Would you come back to British media if you if you got the opportunity? To which there's like a long pause and the very obvious answer afterwards that he would. But I mean, I'm just not sure that there'd be anybody there that'd be willing to take a gamble on on him at this stage of his life. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, if you haven't seen it. Don't bother. Don't bother. Yeah, it's only 15 minutes. You're not, you're not missing out. You've been, uh, I was going to say, reading slash listening to Roddy Collins' autobiography I have. I have. recently. Enjoying it? Yeah, really enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. I bought the audiobook. I'm not really a reader. See, I, I can't, I have to read a physical book. Do you? I can't listen. Like, even just, Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Lights. I was like, if you're going to listen to any audiobook, it's going to be Matthew McConaughey's voice. But I, I had to read ah, it. Ah, no. Um, yeah, I got I, I got drawn into audiobooks with Sinead O'Connor's autobiography last year. Right. And, uh, and she read it, and I just thought, wow, that's... Uh, if that, and that is that is pretty much the benchmark because like, she reads extraordinarily well yeah, and fair. as does Roddy Collins and he's really authentic in terms of his delivery of it. Um, I believe uh, Kathleen was saying before he came in that he has said that he... I uh, didn't enjoy the whole process of of didn't want to do it of, of reading the reading the book. I'm right. delighted he did. I have to say it was re- it was the it wasn't the only reason I bought it, but it was definitely a big 
factor it made it easy to just go ahead and do it and I just can't find the time to read books um, with a busy household at home so mm-hmm. I'm like if, I, if I'm going to be able to uh, consume any books now these days it's going to be audiobook yeah. but it's really good yeah it's really good on his football his life it just paints multi uh, technicolor picture of a uh, larger than life character like he's mm. an extraordinarily I bumped into him upstairs here he was in for an interview I think with Matt Cooper a couple of weeks ago I into, bumped into him upstairs wouldn't know him particularly well but there'd probably be an awareness or whatever I said oh Roddy how are you Adrian from from, uh, from off the ball at loan and he was straight in and he knew that Politician. he knew it off the top of head and he was straight in and we had a great chat about oh, Clone Town oh, oh, oh. who he's a great associate, association with yeah, yeah. as he does with Monaghan but um he, you get a great sense of him. You get a great sense of his family. You get a great sense of his life in football. Um, it's just coming towards the end of the Carlisle days, where I'm about two thirds of the way through, and I wasn't aware there's there's a real depth of the telling of the story around the relationship between himself and John Courtney, who had um, bought Carlisle after a time when when mm. Roddy was managing there, which is the subject of the documentary, of course. <laughs> and I will I will on the, on the back of this go and watch that at some yeah, point. Yeah, so many good strands. I remember when Roddy took over Monaghan United first and um, it, like he came into the club. I was kind of I was borderline on the Monaghan United under 19 squad at the time. Okay. And of course, Monaghan United senior team were in the League of Ireland and he was kind of taking charge of the under 19s, you know, to see if there are certain amount of players that can come through. I remember the first training session where Roddy came down and he was trying to... Like, terrible with names trying to right. remember players names pointed at me and uh, I was up front and he said I'm going to call you Ian Dowie <laughs> wow I mean that's not that's not a compliment and I knew any... straight away who Ian Dowie was and I was like that is not a, that is not, not a compliment, a compliment it's like front. getting called the carbon monoxide canary in the crappy quiz <laughs> I was like I don't know which I'd rather go with the canary I'd rather, I'd rather be called the yeah. carbon monoxide canary he, than he, Ian Dowie he has some great stories there's some brilliant stories in it brilliant anecdotes <laughs> and some of them clearly he's been telling he's been telling for years and they're finally honed there's one about he, he goes to he he takes a few gigs in, in England at various points but one of the gigs he goes into and he doesn't know too many of the playing staff and he goes up to this uh, big lad and he's like you know listen you've got great physicality I'm looking for a player a bit like in the mould of myself who's looking to bully a few players a good strong number nine you know, can, nah, you know head the ball in the back of the net so listen I'm all in on you and the player sort of nodding and agreeing with him and he's like yeah fair enough and then Roddy goes back and um, looks at the sort of details of the playing staff and he's been talking to the first choice goalkeeper who was just too polite to say to him listen I'm oh, not, uh, that's not for me but there's great there's great detail do you know there's great detail around the Steve Collins um, world title fights right. stuff down in Mill Street his own journey from he was managing up the north at that time he had to get a chopper down to Farm 4 and then drive on up to Mill Street for the fight there's loads of <laughs> great detail around that sort of stuff the Tony Quinn stuff and all that that you'd never sorry I'd never I was never aware of before mm-hmm. so yeah, uh, I recommend it and Paul Howard needs a mention because he's obviously the one that's drawn all this out and I think um I would go and get it. It's a, whether you're going to get it in audiobook, which I do recommend, but whichever. The only thing you're missing in the audiobook is the pictures. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's nice to be able to give I it just a bit like of context. I like the smell of a new book. Do you? Yeah. Ah, just well, a this is a whole other level of weirdness now. This yeah, is a strange level of weirdness, <laughs> but yeah, just something about reading a book, I think, is, is good for the head. Yeah. Ah, the audiobook is good. If, you're, if you have oh, time okay. in the car or on a walk or something, yeah. audiobook makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so that's fair. Uh, now, uh, 7.53 a.m. on this Tuesday morning's OTB a.m. Thanks to our partners at Gillette. We have a great prize to give away. Head over to our social channels for a chance to win a Gillette Labs heated razor. A great prize for you or the family this Christmas. Just nominate your heated moment of the weekend for your chance to win. Okay, live to guitar this morning and uh, Kevin Caban is with us. Morning, Kev, how are, how are you? Is it morning? It is morning over there. Oh, yes, it's too early. It's still early in the morning. Yeah, 10, what, 10.50 now. Morning, Shane. How's it going? Adrian, how's it going? Kev, morning to you. Keeping well, keeping well. Uh, we've, been, we've been discussing Ronaldo's goal slash no, no goal last night but um, I think it's Bruno Fernandes' goal isn't it? Yeah I think so I only, I only caught that on the TV yeah um, oh he looked it didn't he it didn't look like he got any well you, you always look at the ball don't you when they slow it down and you can see some sort of change in the movement on the ball and it, it, it didn't change did it? it it was it was definitely Bruno Fernandes' goal it looked like it anyway 100% ah, it was it was how does your how does the remainder yeah. of your tournament shape up now Kev with the with the games like how, how do you approach the, the last round of games yeah. are you going to pick and choose which games you get to go to or how does it work no 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 I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be on every day now every single day that the games are on now until the end of the tournament so uh, last night I was able to get to watch Brazil so I went and watched Bra- Brazil and Switzerland last night which was great uh, and then now it'll be it'll be all studio apart from the Canada game. So we'll, we'll be doing the Canada game again. But they play Morocco in a couple of days' time. But every other day apart from that is we'll be tonight. 
we're doing the uh, yeah I'm on the USA England game tonight and the uh, the Wales Iran game we're doing that game as a set no that's not right is it it's <laughs> uh, England Wales sorry yeah um, yeah England Wales game tonight and then we're the following night I think we're on the earlier kickoff so it's just kind of going to flip between the two but we're just going to take two games but we can obviously only because the, because of the two that's been played together you're going to have to try to keep an eye on both games which. It's not always ideal, actually, when you're trying to analyse the matches, but it'll it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll work out well. The uh, the England Wales game, like of course England, essentially one foot into the last sixteen, regardless. But it'll still yeah. tell us a little bit about where they're at in terms of performance, because the USA game was uh, it was surprising to some people. Um, I guess there was a, an expectation that England would maybe go, go and win that match and kind of go into the last game not needing much at all. But uh, USA mm. put it up to them. Yeah, they did. They did put it up to them, and I think I think you're right in saying it. It'll, it'll show us a little bit where England are in this game. Um, it's it's it's. But what's he going to do? What what is Southgate going to do? Well, you know, there was talk in the last couple of days, wasn't that he's going to bring Foden into the side? I, I mean, I was talking to the guys last night, talking to Joe, and I just said that, that you can't believe in that type of game against the US. If you've seen the US and how they play the high pressurized game that they that they do actually play. Um, it's in the wide areas where you've got to you've got to bring you've got to bring the better players in, and you would have thought that game especially would have been ideal for for Trent Alexander Arnold, but he, he clearly just doesn't want to play. What, what's the point in putting him in the squad? What's the point in having him in there if you're not going to try to use your squad for certain games? And that would have been the ideal chance, I feel, but it wasn't to be in that one. Um, but I think it's right in saying let's see where they are because Wales have been. Dreadful, haven't they? In the two games, they've been awful. The US and, and Iran, they were so bad in both matches. Uh, so you expect England to go and maybe steamroll them a little bit. But I think you'd probably get a performance out of Wales in this one. I think there's going to be that little bit of rivalry. There's going to be that we have to get something. We've got to put it up to them. So it'll be interesting to see in this one how, how this game's going to flow. It was interesting, like I was uh, reading the back pages this morning and um, Gad Southgate was kind of asked in one of the press conferences about the famous slash infamous clip of, of Wales players from Euro 2016 celebrating Iceland's win over England and, and he, he was basically asked, yeah. was it a motivating factor? And he said, I couldn't say, we are aware of some of that. And Luke Shaw had said it, it, it was a nice. So like, I guess for England, you need little motivating tools like that to get up for a yeah. game against Wales? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I know I, we saw it the other day, didn't we, with Croatia and, and Canada when John Herbman had said what he'd said, F Croatia, and all of a sudden Croatia, we're in, we're in a bit of a hole, Dalic is under pressure, he's getting questioned on his team selection and you use anything you can just to, to, to get you through it and they did it, England will do it again. Um, I think we had done the same as Irish players, seeing England get beat against Iceland, I have to say that, I know I would have done, so... It's it's just the way that it is, and I think if England can use anything, I'm sure if, if I was Southgate, I would I would have actually I'd, I'd probably showed them the video again, and I'd probably say, look, you know, these guys, the majority, or there's, there's quite a few that's still involved in 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 the Wales squad that's going into this game, just use it, use one little thing that's going to give you that little bit of an edge in the match. Um, nice top, by the way, Kev. It looks like you've sort of reached that point of the tournament where you're having to dip into the freebies. Do you know? Yeah, that's very true. But you know what, Adrian? You always you'll you'll never come with a like you know a, a great point to start a conversation. <laughs> well, let me let me let me. Like, I'm, I'm you know, actually, I, I like you it. You just Kev. want to come in straight away. Well, yeah, I, no, it's fine. It's fine. But you just I didn't want, say you I didn't like just it. Come in with, I just said it's one of the freebies never, that you know. I'm not talking about whether you like it or not. You're not you're not starting a conversation with you know, Kev. Oh, I saw you know I saw Brazil the other day. You know they were playing in a certain way. It was great to see them. What did you think of that? It's it's to right. come in well, let's, with something. Let's get into that. Something so negative. Pre tournament, pre tournament. You uh, you uh, and I want to loop back to England, uh, Wales, but you've drawn me out now. Um, pre tournament, you said that the US were brutal, that they weren't going anywhere fast, and they've obviously pulled off a draw against Wales and a draw against England. Uh, yeah. If it goes with odds, they'll they'll did get I past Iran today. Did I say br- did I say brutal? Pr- progress with some version of that. So you're accepting. Uh, you have to accept not, at some point not, here that you not were not very good. You were wrong about that. Not very good. No, 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 not very good. Did I, what did I say about them? And I think Shane maybe even back me up. I said they don't create chances. They've got a lot of energy in the team. Tyler Adams, top class player. I could probably say he's maybe one of the best midfielders, if not the best midfielders of the tournament so far. But up front, they don't create chances. They they don't have a nine. Pulisic works hard, just doesn't do enough, in my opinion, up front. They just don't create chances. So they've got a lot of energy, and they, but they're missing. And I, that's what I said about the US. And I stand by that. I don't like them. I don't think they're a very good side. And uh, 
I think in the midfield, they've got three very good midfield players, certainly two in, in Adams and Moose and look very, very good. But mm. no, what, what, did, what did they create against England? What did they really create against Wales? They, they don't create chances. That's the thing, or a lot of chances. So I think they're quite predictable in how they're going to play. Against against England, England had to play Trent Alexander-Arnold. They had to get the ball into wide areas because the, everything's through the centre. Everything, it's high energy, you know, pleasing on the eye. It'll be pleasing to a neutral like yourself, Adrian, that, that's never really played the game, you know, and doesn't understand. <laughs> it's only a matter of time, isn't it, before that. <laughs> I have to agree on Musa. He's been he's been absolutely exceptional. Um, but, and the, look, they'll probably go through. The, 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 Adam, Adam, Adams is the one, though, Adrian. I, I, I honestly, really? I... I, I I saw him play at Leipzig. And it wasn't. He was actually for the US. In it was actually in the Canada game, probably going back eighteen months now. And I knew that when I watched him, I thought, yeah, he's a, a really really good player. And I saw him at Leipzig a good few times. Then it um, it really impressed me. And I thought I thought they got a steal Leeds when they got him. I could not believe there was there wasn't maybe another. And and it's not no disrespect to Leeds or anything, but I was so surprised that. Maybe even a Juventus or one of the top sides around the world. He might not necessarily have gone into a top four Premier League club, but I was surprised that one or two others didn't take them. And Jesse Marsh's relationship with him was obviously the influential factor there. But mm. uh, I think Leeds Leeds got a steal when they got him in. I, I think he's absolutely outstanding footballer. Gareth Bale's been very disappointing, obviously, so far. And like any case to be made for Wales pulling off the impossible tonight in every regard is sort of hooked around him and performing well. And he's been yeah. so disappointing so far. Is he basically paying the price for been a couple of years in semi-retirement, Kev? Or what's your read on why he's been so sluggish? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't rule that out. I, you know, if I if, if I'm picking my best Premier League eleven, Bale would would be in it at its best. I don't think there was anyone to touch him um, when he was at Spurs when he had that couple of years there. But people don't necessarily judge it as that. People would always judge it on the length of their career and things like that. And he's had an, he has had an outstanding career. He probably had a four or five year spell in between Tottenham and then his first couple of years at, at Madrid, where he was just sensational. I just, I just used to love watching him. Uh, but he's well past that now. He is, and um, I think it's harsh to judge him at times because of the injuries as well that he's had. Because he's never really been fit properly for probably about three years, maybe even four years at this stage. And when he when he turns up when he plays he's, he's still going to have his moments because of the ability that he has but um i mean even when he came over to the mls evan was waiting in anticipation that he was going to do something he just wasn't fit he was never fit in any of the games i think i think i read before the tournament he played i think it was 27 minutes or something like that 20 he's played 27 minutes of football since i think since september 18th or something like that it, it, it's a really strange start on him he just he just doesn't play He's on the bench for he's on the bench for LAFC. He's not even getting a game in the MLS. So you know something's something's not right with him. And it's hard for a player, no matter how good you are, to, to turn it off and on to, to all of a sudden in a World Cup in those big games to, to suddenly say I'm fit and ready for it and you know I'm 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 I'm, I'm my peak condition ready ready for for the big game. And I know Rob Page continuously says whatever happens, get Gareth Bale is going to play. And he has to play him because he's Wales' his best player, probably best player ever, one of the best. Um, one of the best, you know, I heard Nathan talking about it being probably the best. You could put it up an argument to say he's the best British player ever because of what he's achieved. But he, he can't turn it off and on and he's he's been seriously lacking in the last few years and I think that's just caught up with him. I really do think that, yeah. I suppose a lot of the narrative with England, Kev, has circled around Phil Foden and, I mean... <laughs> I know Southgate has kind of spoken about needing to find the right formula to get him into the team, and I understand that. But I mean, what twenty twenty five minutes against Iran, unused sub against against yeah. the United States? Like you're talking about best players. Like there's an argument that Foden is England's best player. It, it, do you yeah. not try and get him into the team in some way and build the formula, whatever that means, around him? Definitely, definitely have to get him. I, I couldn't even believe in the Iran game. I know they won six. I, I could not believe that when he started in his eleven. Like we, every, everyone's picking who, the, what, which way they think Southgate's going to go. Is he going to go with the five? Is he going to go with the four? Whatever system he's going to use, but whichever system you feel England's going to play, we all had probably first first man down was Foden, and everything else falls in around that. I thought he might have even started him in the um, in the second game against uh, against the US. I thought he'd have changed things up. Virtually every nation has made changes after the first game. France were brilliant, made two or three changes. Uh, Brazil were probably forced to make a change in fairness, but 
there was most of the teams made a couple of changes, and I, I think that's always the best way to do it because it's just it, it keeps everybody almost focused. If if you know what I mean, that how can, people might say, "Why are you not focused at a World Cup?" It still comes down to it. I want to play every game. I want to play. So if you're making those changes and you you're picking some of these other such talented players that England have, and you and you're making two or three changes and putting them in. Everyone's had a game then, or the best players have had a game going into the third game, certainly when you approach the knockout uh, phase of the tournament. So I, I, I couldn't believe he didn't even start him in one, one or the other match, but he felt as though by sticking with the state, same 11 for the US game, that was going to work. But I, 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 as I said earlier on, I thought Trent Alexander-Arnold was, was prime for that USA game. I think if, if you watch the way the, the US play, everything narrow and things like this. But, but Foden is the one player he's... He is, he is England's best player. He's been probably right up there with the very best in the Premier League over the last couple of years. I think England's insistence, and I think we, we saw it even going into the Euros or Southgate's insistence on on having that little bit of, of, of an approach is let's not concede. If we don't concede a goal, we'll be fine. But I think even Iran showed that with the chances that they had, even aside of the two goals that they scored, Iran had one or two chances where a straight ball got in behind Maguire and Stones. They are vulnerable to quick to quick transition, uh, and I, I know that's maybe an argument to say why he won't play Trent, Trent Alexander Arnold. But it was all it, with England in this group stage. It's going to be about what you do when you have the ball. Get your best players into positions that's going to provide. Who's your best cross of the ball, Alexander Arnold? Who's your your most creative player, Phil Foden? And I, just, I can't believe not no other nation, none of the top nations would ever have it that you just don't play your best player. You, it, it just doesn't happen. Phil Foden would get into every single other, other side at this World Cup and so would Trent Alexander-Arnold. And Southgate approach at times, it just, I, I don't know, it, it baffles me. It does. I just, I, I think he's almost hoping that the sides, or by keeping a clean sheet, he'll win a game 1-0 or he'll make sure that he just gets that result to get them over the line. And mm. I just feel England's going to fall short again come, come knockout stage against one of the best teams. We've got a we've got a message in here from from Anthony Ryan on YouTube, uh, lads. Could you ask Kev why strong, experienced teams like Uruguay can freeze and totally fail to turn up two matches in a row? Like, yeah. is there is there an element of this? Like, it's almost like the Olympic athlete. Like, it comes around at once every four years. So when it comes yeah. around, there's a serious bit of pressure on, and they kind of you get kind of get that sense from Uruguay that they're putting a serious amount of pressure on themselves, and it's backfiring. Yeah, it's, ner- it's nervousness. No matter who you are, even even Neymar and the expectancy that's on him and Brazil, Messi. I mean, in fairness, Messi's been pretty. He has been pretty poor in the in the two games, but and that's largely been down to how sides have, have played up against him, the Saudis and Mexico. What they did up against him was just squeeze the life out of the game. More so, more so Saudi actually. Um, so the best players, if from from what I've seen, even what Morocco did in the, in the first game, I thought Mor- Morocco have been brilliant in the first two matches that they've played as well. And what they've done, they just squeezed the game out of uh, out of out of Croatia and, and Belgium. So sides are going to find it difficult. They're going to be nervous. They're going to be. There's going to be a, the expectancy that's on the shoulders when you play for, when you play for your country. And I've always said it, it's just totally different. It's totally different. You, you can get into a comfortable rhythm at your club. Go under the radar a bit, and again, even the big boys that's that's under scrutiny. That it, it's almost as if you can just you can just keep going. It just becomes natural, and that rhythm just goes in week to week. But there is always that, you know, the World Cup's coming around, or or a big international's coming around in three or four weeks' time. It's it's always in your mind. So when you meet up with the players, and this has almost become. Like uh, the first game, albeit it was a World Cup, but they've only had four or five days, six days to prepare. Mm. And all, all the coaches are complaining about the lack of preparation time. But that's what it's been. It's just you go, you go straight into the games off the back of club football. So the, the nervousness, I'm, I'm sure it catches up with everyone, no matter who they are. And that, and that, um, that will not go away, no matter, who, no matter who it is. So if you've got the players around you that can, that can settle each other down and you've got that togetherness, yes, that I'm, I'm certain that helps. I know Mbappe's been been brilliant and he's had so much effect on this on this tournament. But I felt it affected him in the Euros. I think I felt as that that nervousness for a big tournament affected him. I think he maybe I think he's maybe learned from that a little bit. So um, yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. Uruguay were were dreadful, really. And I mean, I don't know what your thought about the penalty last night. And I, I know everyone's telling me about the 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 Fernandez thing, but I thought that 
when he brought Suarez on last night, Uruguay, Uruguay just was starting to go for it. They hit the post and he felt as though that there might be something for Uruguay late on in, in the match. But I was watching watching the game and I, it, was, it was no penalty, absolutely no penalty it, because there is no way that as uh, Fernandez goes past, goes past the player, he nutmegs him and he, he's falling over. That, that can never be handballed. There's no, there's no intention to, to it. He's not put his hand in an unnatural position. The referee shouldn't have been put in a position to go and make a call on that. Uh, so no penalty. Should have just gone with the on-field call because the referee saw exactly what had happened. Um, no penalty. Absolutely no penalty ever. That the, the, only, the, in, only in case for, the only case for it is, and like, look, I was watching, I had caught the punditry on, I missed it on TSN, Shane, last mm-hmm. night, but I caught the punditry on ITV. Then, no, they then, all thought it was a pen. I, I wasn't on. I wasn't no, on, no, Adrian. I, I, I would... Oh, did they? Did they? they? they were, so, oh, clear, well, clear well Joe, Joe Cole on ITV. Joe Cole on ITV said, uh, "You know, any football person, which is a which is a, a comment that when you start out with, you you know, <laughs> strikes me absolutely bonkers. Any football ah, person is so go. condescending to begin with to his audience. Apart from the, anyway, not the point. Uh, they all agreed that it wasn't a penalty. And Stephen Kelly was the only one on the RT panel who said that he felt it was. He said, by the letter of the law, it's not. But I feel as if it was. And I have some sympathy for that because, like, look, yeah, I take no, the point. He, I, he, he's, I, where is he going to put his hand, right? But think about it a different way, right? When Fernandez puts the ball through, right? If if he d- if it doesn't touch his hand, Fernandez through and goal. Mm. This, this is it, it's it's a huge grey area of the law, isn't it? That's that's the problem. Mm. I think. I think is it is it I don't I don't even know the law is it law fourteen I don't know I should know it but um, the, the law states they talk about in, in, in intent as well non natural position and mm. things like this but I think I think they talk about intent and it still comes down to which is a lot of garbage because we're not seeing but how many times as a player when he's stopping a shot that's two yards away from him and he's just putting his hands out hits his hand to get the penalty not, how can that be intentional there's no chance it can be he's just trying to he's just reacting to someone that's shooting so. It, that in that if in that respect it should never have been given. But I, I know what Stephen's saying. I, I think this one is it, we've probably never really seen this type of its kind before. So it's up, football at the game will always throw up this type of scenario where we're going. Oh, we've never seen that type of thing before. But in my opinion, it should never have been given. But I understand what Stephen's saying because mm-hmm. you know, as I say, it's, it's denying that goal scoring opportunity. Could the could the Uruguay defenders have got back into shape to try to to block him? It looked like he was going through on it, but. There was no way in a million years that, that the Uruguay defender could have done anything differently. He, you know, he, it wasn't unnatural. He was just literally going for the challenge. He was done with a lovely bit of skill uh, with a little nutmeg. So how could he have done anything different? He should not. I, I'm feeling that what I'm seeing in, in the tournament, I think there's some bad decisions. And, and I go back to the Harry Maguire incident in the Iran game. You remember the Harry Maguire incident where he was kind of rugby tackled by the Iran player? And it was a clear penalty. There's clearer penalties you're going to give. It wasn't sent for review. And then the Iran player in uh, in later on in the match that had his shirt tugged, was it Stones? I think it was. I'm not too sure whoever it was had the, had his shirt tugged. And probably it was it was definitely a way less incident or way less less of a foul than than Maguire. But they give the penalty. And I think that Maguire set the tone for what referees are saying. I think there was maybe something that was mentioned to say, look, we can't be getting these sort of decisions wrong. It will review everything. And uh, there's been a couple, the Ronaldo one the other night as well, Ronaldo's fallen over. There was one in the Qatar game, the Qatar match where, you know, there was a slight touch. It, it was a slight touch on the car. The guy's just fallen backwards. It's not a pen. Just mm. because there's contact in the penalty area doesn't necessarily mean it's a penalty. So, I think I think there have been mistaken in the judgment now, maybe down to what was said around that Maguire penalty, and so that's what goes back to that one. I I, I can't see it, Adrian. I, I I don't think it's a penalty, and I don't think the referee was helped, and I don't think the referees have been helped by who's in the VAR booth because they're they're asking the referee to review it, and when you're asked to review it, you're almost you second guess yourself, and you feel as though you have to you have to overturn the decision that you, that you've made on the pitch. Uh, just finally, Kev, before we let you go. Um... Messi to Inter Miami is being discussed and talked about potentially whether it's after the World Cup or maybe yeah. uh, towards the summer uh, this would be the highlight of Messi's career wouldn't it being managed by, by the great Phil Neville by the great Phil Neville I know it's going to be um, they've been talking it for a long time I think he's, his family live in Miami don't they I think his dad and uh, or he has a place in Miami so he's been talked about for a long time that he's going to be joining uh, going to be joining Miami there's probably only three clubs that probably would have taken him and Miami would have been one of those so yeah uh, I think it'd be great for the league. It will be. I, I just like. I'd like to have maybe seen him play 
try to win a Champions League for another two seasons, maybe just play at that real top elite level for another couple of years in Europe before that move would have taken place. He's not young. He's got a lot of miles on the clock as well. And I think we're, we're maybe even seeing that now. Um, I think the teammates that he's got around him at PSG is certainly helping him helping him maybe to, to reach the level that he's been at. We, we saw it at, at Barcelona even last season. He, he, it was a bit of a struggle for him at times because of the position that Barcelona were in. So it might be a good time to go and enjoy his football for the last few years again. Um, I think there'll be less pressure on him. I think he will um, he will certainly be less recognisable, I think, certainly playing in Miami than he will be anywhere else in the world. So I think it, I think it'd be good for him uh, if he wants that sort of quieter lifestyle because... The league is um, is very very different from uh, from anywhere else in Europe. Yeah, he'd be playing alongside a former Republic of Ireland underage international. Who's that? We we thrown out to our uh, our MLS expert, the one person that we could get in the line that would know an MLS squad inside out. Chain. He's throwing you under the bus here, Kev. Oh, yeah, I like a great, great Who's football that? person Who's like that? like Kev was going to know this one off the top of his. Who's a, that? A link. Well, he, well he. he Gonzalo Higuain just he he announced he's like retiring. No, he's not a former season, international goal. Higuain. No, no. I'm just talking about the squad. The, the you're doing a Nathan Murphy on it now. You're spooling through the information you know, which is no relevance to the yeah. answer whatsoever. Yeah. Who? No, I'm asking. I, I ask you the question. Links the question, links to the manager. Oh, his son. Yeah, Phil's son, of course. Yeah, Harvey. Yeah, should, yeah. Harvey Neville. Oh yeah. He yeah. had one appearance yeah. that he won or 19, something like that. Kev, football, yeah, football man Adrian Barry came out with this one this morning. Football man, yeah. That's, football. That's you can, you can read all you can read all the stats you want. <laughs> you know, uh, the ultimate, <laughs> the yeah. ultimate insult. <laughs> Kev, great stuff as always. <laughs> we'll check in across the next couple of days, Kev. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Cheers, lads. Good, man, good luck. Kevin Gabal there, of course, on the line live from Qatar. Uh, we'll be with Kev, of course, as I said, across the next couple of days. Coming in from uh, from Dennis Ryan. Is noted Sunday league striker Shane still hopeful for Fred as possible player of the tournament? Interesting take. Well, Dennis, I did not say Fred would be player of the tournament. I, in fact, said Casemiro will be player of the tournament. Oh. So that was You're saying thing. that with a smugness that suggests well, that that might still happen. I mean, I mean it could do. That was a good been, goal yesterday. He's been pretty good. He's been pretty good in every game. He was very good. Did he mean game. that goal yesterday? I know it took a slight deflection on the way in. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just feel like he's... Uh, look, if Richarlison keeps banging in the goals, he'll be player of the tournament if Brazil win the tournament. But yeah, I think there was a great moment on the on the big screen during the Brazil game. Which R9, Ronaldo pops up on the big screen oh, and <laughs> pulls to the fan with the, with the 2002 Ronaldo haircut. Him and uh, Roberto Carlos sat down... Class Like mopping their brows Watching yeah. the game Unreal Nice, nice life uh, 17 minutes past 8 On uh, this Tuesday morning's OTB AM Brayburn Coffee Is the official coffee partner Of OTB The festive season Is officially here So why not enjoy A shot of gingerbread goodness In your Brayburn Coffee today Available at Apple Green Locations nationwide Now after this Very short break We'll be joined by the Joint Limerick Senior Football Captain Ian Corbett Fresh from Newcastle West Qualifying for their very first Munster final Since 1987 Back in a sec OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio From the good Neymar can push the ball between your legs because he just sees things To the not so good Hold on, this now affects football We'll have to find another way to protest like it was that bad That's right, it's the 2022 World Cup Off the Ball will bring you the best insight and analysis as well as the big stories off the pitch from the World Cup in Qatar. All 11 players from both sides walk on their own back. Send us all off, kid. Subscribe to the OTB Football Podcast feed now. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent modes. 18 minutes past eight on this Tuesday morning's OTB AM with myself and Adrian. Delighted to say the Limerick Joint Senior Football Captain Ian Corbett joins us on the line now this morning. Morning, Ian. How are things? Morning, lads. How are you? Keeping well. We're keeping well. Thanks for joining us. Um, big weekend last weekend for Newcastle West, your club. Uh, famous victory. So it uh, had to go to extra time against Clonmel Commercials. But any win against a team of that calibre, I mean, you're going to take it. Yeah, look, it was a great day for the club. Um, I suppose for the last few years, kind of this group, uh, we've had a few near misses in Munster Club. Uh, we lost the two eventual winners in the first round. Um, so it was great to get over the line like we knew how good Clamel were after their performance against Nemo, but uh, went up there with plenty of belief and thankfully we got over the line, uh, just about, but we got over the line anyway. So, as I said, first Limerick side to reach the Munster Senior Football Final in 14 years, uh, and of course you'll contest the, the Munster Final for the first time since 87, so it's Kerry's, Kerrin's O'Reilly's on Saturday 11th of December, um, so nice, nice handy one in the final for you too, Ian. <laughs> I don't think any team that comes out of Kerry is going to be handy. Uh, 
yeah, look, it's, it's a very tough task again. Um, but every team in this competition, in all the provincial competitions, are look, they're county champions for a reason. They're going to be good sides. So it's a tough test, uh, but one we're looking forward to. Like a, it strikes me, Newcastle West, um, so decent sized catchment area, I suppose, Ian, for, for people unfamiliar with the club. But uh, when you won that first senior club with, with, the, with the, the club in 2015, uh, your first since 1992 as a club, uh, like, would you have been seen as underachievers given the size of the town, or would that have been seen as a, as a, as a relatively normal gap? Um, well, I think we've only six won in the club's history. Um, I don't know, I suppose, being the big town in Limerick, we kind of have that uh, mentality of being townies and a bit soft. Uh, we'd be known to kind of get on each other's back uh, in years gone by, but... Um, Thankfully, that's kind of changed the last few years. Uh, we led come down from Donegal and coaches. Uh, Anton McFadden in 2015, he kind of changed the whole mindset of the club. And I suppose even since he's left, the players that were involved have kind of continued that and fellas are coming in now, young lads coming in and they're buying into that mindset, I suppose. What do you mean get it, uh, get on just back in? You mean like within the club? No, just on the field. And I suppose like someone might do something silly and get a red card. So you know, we'd be kind of, it would have always been said, if, if you bring Newcastle down the stretch in a tight game, they'll probably lose it themselves rather than you having to beat them. Um, and we did that in plenty of games and we've done it a few times since, but we've definitely got, it's something we've improved at. Did you like sit down as a group and address it? Um, I, I just think we weren't, we weren't hard enough on ourselves. Um, kind of when I was starting off, um, we look for soft excuses rather than looking at ourselves. Um, ultimately, we're the ones on the field. You can blame management, coaches, I suppose, the committee if things weren't provided. But all them things were always provided. Uh, we were always well looked after. Uh, so we just had to really look at ourselves. And if we were losing games, it was probably down to us. Is that is that stuff? Because I'm sure there's plenty of club players at all levels, at all sports around the country listening in now and sort of wondering... How do you get from where you were to where you're at? Like, is it is it an easy fix? Is it like a deep cultural thing? Does it take a bit of time? Uh, I wouldn't say it's easy. Like, we we really, really trained hard. Um, Anton would have been involved with that Donegal team in 2012. And I think he brought a lot of that training down. Like, we were out running in the field, like, when there was no lights. It was pitch dark. And you could just see someone in a high-vis jacket at a line and you'd run to that line and back. Um, so it's just real... I suppose we really worked hard and we knew we had that in the bank. So when games were in the melting pot, we knew we had that work done and that kind of brought us over the line. And I think even in the last few years, it's something we've even improved further. Uh, we've become we've become pretty good at winning tight games or just about surviving. And the last two games, we'd kick a, we'd kick a score with the last kick of the game to get to extra time. Um, so it's, it's definitely a strength of the team. That's definitely a, a positive to take, Ian. I feel like... Uh, and even I, I remember you speaking before about the the twenty fifteen Munster quarter final against Clonmel again, where you're four points up with with five minutes left, uh, and then you squander that lead, and Clonmel go on to win the Munster championship. Like, you know, I, I'm sure you're not thinking about it directly when you're in normal time or in injury time at the weekend, but to go from that back in twenty fifteen to dominating the stakes in injury time and the scoring when when it really mattered uh, last weekend must be quite nice when you think back to the disappointment of of seven years ago, for example. Yeah, uh, look, that was that was a tough day to take. We had the game won probably, um, and we just let it slip. And that was probably experience. It was our first time. First, everyone on the field that day from our club, anyway, it was our first provincial game with the club. Um, and I suppose we just for us coming down the home stretch. Um, it was a bit different the weekend. We were the ones coming from behind and had to get the last gas equaliser. Um, but I suppose we just knew. I suppose going into the game that no matter how far ahead we got. Clamel could just turn it on. They did that just before half time. We were kind of we were kind of comfortable. We were up three points and but they got one two in about three minutes. Um but we responded well to that. Got a score before half time and got the first score after half time. It was nearly like a World Cup match at the end. It was like five minutes of at a time and then another three after that. It was like uh, they were they were pulling from nowhere. And you weren't complaining too much, uh, obviously, when Rowan O'Connor O'Connor kicked the equalizer. Were you aware of the clock? Like given the context of everything you've just been talking about, were you aware of the clock? We Thinking about it, were you talking um, about it? Yeah, like we got a chance just before that. Uh, Emmett got through and uh, it just dropped short. And I knew there was about a minute left and Clamel went down the field and we got a turnover. And then I suppose they were kind of just 
just stop him. So it ended up getting two black cards and there was kind of, the ref was dealing with a few things. So I kind of, I knew it was gone over the five, but mm. I knew there was still time to be added. The ref probably might have allowed maybe an extra minute or so, but I suppose we were in there 45 kind of probing for that score. And that's the way football is in hurling. You, you, you're always kind of going to get that last attack. Uh, the minute we kicked the shot wide or got turned over, that was it. Uh, and thankfully, Ruan popped up in front of the goals and kicked it over. Uh, the club, Ian itself, Newcastle West, like, is it a... Um... As Limerick is very much becoming a dual county as at the moment. I think last year was the first year both the football and hurling teams have been in the the Munster final for for quite some time, uh, decades in fact. Um, like when you when you're starting off with the you know under sevens, under eights, and on a Saturday morning or whatever with with Newcastle West, are, are you playing both? Did you pick one? Was it what, what was the the scenario in the club and and what's it like today? Um, you play both, Chad, yeah, the whole way up. Um, both groups are usually kind of trained by the same people. You might have one or two different coaches in for hurling or football. We have about 14 dual players. Um, right. So we have a big crossover, and that was very difficult during the early parts of the year because um, Limerick plays plays a lot of games. Like, we had five group games in football, and the hurlers had seven group games, championship games. Like So that was really tough on the lads, but we have the same manager over hurling and football, so Jimmy managed that well. Um, yeah, and I suppose in Newcastle anyway, there definitely be a big emphasis on both football and hurling. I'm I'm looking at the the, the team and and um, I guess at club level you need those well you need the young lads coming through but you need the wily veterans as well and and uh, Mike McMahon comes to mind like one three man of the match in the county final um that like I know he turned thirty seven quite recently as well so you look at players like that I'm sure Ian on the on the team and you're thinking that's why you need lads at club level to maybe give that extra year or two if they have it because I mean you can't buy experience. Yeah, I, I think Mike's the only one on the team that was would have been at the 87 months the final. Um, so he might tell us a few <laughs> tales about that over the next two weeks. Um, yeah, look, Mike's an incredible athlete. Uh, a dual player, again, like played probably nine or ten weeks in a row of championship games. And I don't think Mike will be finished this year, or probably not next year. Um, he just he just loves the club. His family is ingrained in the club. The McMahons would be a well-known name around Newcastle. And uh, Mike will definitely play for as long as he's proving useful and he's definitely proven useful this year so far I've seen it with my own club as well where you, you've, you've lads like that who are big target men and tall and can catch can catch a high ball strikes me like the mark the attacking mark might have been something that maybe I mean went right up Mike's alley because that, that sort of rule coming in just makes him a, a dominant force yeah look I suppose to be realistic about it there's probably not many men like Max size playing club football um, probably gives us a, a real outlet Um but I suppose it kind of works both ways. Teams put such an emphasis on stopping Mike, maybe having a sweeper, possibly two at times, that it allows the space around the middle for, I suppose, the runners around the middle to get through and create chances um, when teams are preoccupied with Mike. And we we had Billy Lee on the on, on the show, um, uh, you know, since his since his tenure ended with Limerick, and and to look a fascinating character and someone who's done so much as you as you well know for for Limerick football. You've got Ray Dempsey coming on board now this year, and and look, the links were fairly strong with between it was between himself and Kevin McStay, I guess, for that Mayo gig. But a uh, lot of people have a lot of good things to say about Ray Dempsey when it comes to to coaching. And um, have you had had many dealings with him so far, Ian, or or how's that been? Because clearly yeah, there's an like, excitement um, there. We've had I've had. I've spoke to Ray a few times. Um, to be fair to him, he's kind of letting letting the few Newcastle lads that are involved with Limerick focus on the club at the moment. He's put no pressure on us. Uh, so I suppose we're thankful for that. Look, it was a good appointment by the county board. Um, anyone that is right in the mix for the Mayo job is obviously going to have strong credentials. Um, and I suppose, look, it'll be up to Ray, his management team and the players to build on the good work that Billy has done over the past six years. Does it, um, like, uh, just looking at sort of recent Munster finals, Ian, like the uh, Drumcaller Broadford 15 years ago, you've Monoline, um, I think maybe since that, but it's not often that Limerick teams are getting to the Munster final. Is that, is that a factor for you or is it just, that's it and we'll, we'll think about that another day, but for now we need to get, get about the business of trying to win one? Yeah, look, I suppose we'll get a certain amount of praise for reaching the Munster final, but we're in a final to win it. Um, That'll be the focus of the group um, for the next two weeks. Um, who knows when we'll get another chance to play in a final. Some of us might never get another chance to play in a club final, so we have to make the most of the opportunity while we're there. Just on Limerick generally, um, I wondered, like on the face of it, given the size of the county, the population, you would think that they should be more regularly up in the higher echelons of um, of football in the country and obviously promotion 
uh, promotion this year and that, that I'm sure will help. Is it the competitiveness between like the rugby it's obviously uh, the city is a big um, soccer town uh, the hurling obviously coming on over the last few years is that the reason that that Limerick are not more regularly up amongst the Division 1 teams or in the mix towards the end of the championship or what's your take on um, how they how they might given given what you've been talking to us a little bit earlier on about obviously how you've managed to advance things on the club level how Limerick might advance more on the intercounty scene um, I think a lot of it is probably from underage Unfortunately, Limerick have no schools playing Corny and um, They had an amalgamation there for a few years and it was giving young lads the opportunity to play football at the highest level. But I don't know who decided it, but they decided that amalgamations weren't allowed. And there's probably no school on its own in Limerick strong enough. But I suppose when we're competing with the Corks, Kerrys, I think Clamel have a school in it, Flannins are in it. Like I suppose it's just us and Waterford that don't have schools competing at that level. You see it in Limerick with the Hurling. Uh, for a few years, there was three or four schools playing Harty Cup. Um, so I suppose that kind of puts massive emphasis then on the academy. And I suppose underage, then you have kids trying to play soccer, rugby, hurling, football. Um, but I think it's something that's definitely improved. We're seeing lads coming through from the academy that have the strength and conditioning work done. And where when I started, I'd have had very little strength and conditioning done prior to playing senior football. Uh, but thankfully, that's kind of changing and lads are more prepared rather than needing the two or three years to get ready for inter-county football. That stuff in the schools is mad, isn't it? Like, that uh, yeah, should be the foundation like basis for, for everything. I suppose, like, it is disappointing. Um, I suppose the GA should probably be doing more that if Limerick don't have a school strong enough, they should be allowed to join three or four schools. Um, I think I could be wrong that um, the Waterford Colleges a few years ago had some amalgamation and it was kind of an all-star team and maybe five or six of them have ended up with all-stars and I suppose the powers that be, the traditional schools probably didn't like that and it affected all the amalgamations. Like It would be so beneficial for 20 lads from Limerick to be playing uh, Kearney Worry, but unfortunately at the moment that isn't the case anyway. I'm looking at the uh, the uh, Division 2 teams set for, for next year in the in the league, uh, Ian, and uh, so yourself and Lowe, yourselves and Lowe, of course, promoted from Division 3 you had the Dubs and Kildare relegated from Division 1 to 2. And then you have Clare, Cork, Derry and Meath uh, already there as, as established uh, Division 1 teams at this stage. Nice handy start for you as well. You're, you're away to Derry in the opening game. And then you have uh, the Dubs coming down to Limerick. So uh, some decent fixtures to look forward to in Division 2. Yeah, um, I think whoever's in the fixtures committee didn't really look after it too well. But look, we're going to have to play them at some stage. Um, two massive games like for Dublin to be coming down to Limerick, I suppose. We'll draw a massive crowd. It'll give the kids the opportunity to see the likes of Brian Fint and Kieran Kilkenny. We saw that the weekend. There was Fossa were playing a junior Munster club game. And it's it's all loud out in Castleman. Um so it's great for the kids of Limerick to see these superstars, all stars, uh coming to Limerick and playing against the Limerick lads and you can only promote football in the county. I know you're a you're a, you're a guard base down in uh, in, in Cairn South Tip, but uh, the um it struck me, I remember an in interview, interview you did before where you're talking about covering the, I think it was maybe Tip and Cork playing in Thurles and Seppa Stadium um, in a in a hurling match and, uh, you know, you're on duty and then the following week you're you're playing a match. So, like, if, if anything almost personifies and, and uh, typifies the, the amateur ethos and nature of the GEA, it's something like that where you're on duty as a guard at a, at a big match and then the following week you're playing. Like, it, it, must, it must feel strange at times. Yeah, um... I suppose, look, it's it's the choice of the job. Um, you need a few extra guards around Turles for the big Munster hurling games. Um, I was up there working. And then the following week, you're seeing the guards around Clarny doing the same thing that I was doing the week previously uh, in preparation for the football final. I know lads' heads probably get wrecked walking around. Like even I'm thinking of yourselves before the, the Munster final last, last season. I mean... Is it easier for yourself when you're based in somewhere like Care, where it's a hurling stronghold that maybe you don't get the head wrecked as much with people asking questions about, oh, how's the prep for Kerry going this weekend? Um, yeah, I suppose, look, most people I work with probably wouldn't, well, people I work with obviously know I play football for Limerick, but the people you're interacting and dealing with don't. Like, um, Look, I suppose anyone that comes up asking you questions is probably coming from a good spot, but I suppose you can get sick of repeating the same. And so you're giving them cliche answers anyway so they're not going to get a whole pile from speaking to you but um, I suppose it all comes from a good place 
Absolutely. Uh, listen, Ian, uh, great stuff mm-hmm. and uh, really appreciate your time this morning. So Saturday 11th of December, you have the Munster uh, football final against Kerry's, Kerrins O'Reilly's with, uh, with yourselves in Newcastle West. So very best of luck and uh, I'm sure we'll check in after you've, uh, you've got the silverware secured. Cheers, lads. Thanks, William. Good man. Ian Corbett there, the uh, Joint Limerick Senior Football Captain at uh, 8 34 am on this uh, Tuesday morning's OTB AM. We're delighted to have our own Tommy Rooney live on the line this morning. Morning, Tommy. How are things? Morning, Shane. How are you, Adrian? Tommy. Keeping well. Tommy Rooney, of course, of Good. the Football Pod. And Tommy, you've had a you've had a big one this week on the Football Pod. We've had a long season, Shane. We're 44 episodes in, as Paddy Andrews keeps reminding me. Is this the last one? Is this the last one? Yeah, Paddy, this is the last one. And James Horan joined us for his first interview since he stepped down as Mayo boss in June. So, um, great to get James on. Uh, delighted that he joined us for an hour. He was formerly of this parish. He, he did quite a bit of his Adrian and off the ball. The last time that he stepped down back in 2014, he said back then that the tank was empty. Um, he obviously came back for a second stint as Mayo boss. Shane, he's, um, he's had a huge influence over Mayo in the last 12 years. Will I bring you a, a snippet or two from the piece? Please do. This almost nearly didn't happen for Mayo and James Horan. He's 38 years old back in 2010. He was not the favourite to get the Mayo job. There were seven names thrown into the hat. Mick O'Dwyer had actually put himself forward at the time. But after a bit of a backlash in the Mayo people, he stepped back and he did one more year in Wicklow before he finished up as an intercounty manager. Tommy Lyons, the former Dublin manager, was the hot favourite. But on the night, it was a dramatic night itself. I said it could be a documentary and the night Horn was appointed. He's named as boss. Um, but Mayo football is at a low ebb and it nearly got worse a few months later in his first championship game. London bring them to extra time. They just about scrape over the line. And have a listen to this. It's a couple of weeks after that. Listen to what a county board official said though. You go back to um, our, the first championship game, go, went to extra time with London and got out by the skin of our teeth and and there was people hissing at us after that game and we had to walk through the beer tent to get to the bus and I tell you I Please. thought I thought we were going to be stoned I I, I really did so uh, look we, we 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 got out of that but it's just to your point Tommy it, just belief and everything else was just so so it was so shaky then you know we played, think played Galway a few weeks later we're four points down at half time against Galway in the next round and uh, met an official, I won't say it was, who was telling me that this doesn't go well, you're gone, pal. Yeah. Um, Jesus. So, yeah, yeah, look, these, 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 you know, you know, so it would have been the quickest intercounty manager in career <laughs> of all time. But that, but, but everyone was rattled and, you know, it was that kind of funny in, in the dressing room, halftime, four points down, everything rattled. We just knew we were going to win that game where, where things were, you know, for, for whatever combination of reasons, you know, and we just, just, just kicked on and every every training session, every day, every chat, every conversation got a little bit bit more together or a bit more belief and it just it built from there, you know. Jesus. I mean, no people love their football, but can you imagine the pressure just, in a game like that? And like that's classic County Board carry on. It's classic GA carry on, isn't it? Like I mean I know, I know. that the London story he's he chatted about, people are aware that he you know, it nearly came asunder, yeah. right? But like at the same time, that you don't need. What's this like busybody getting involved with it? I I, I just think that that sometimes is, is what has to be dealt with in, in some in some counties, Crazy you know. Stuff. Um, and we we do our best lads to try and chart that kind of journey that that Horn had with Mayo as manager because, like, you take it for granted now that Mayo are in the in the mix every year, mm. but for the four seasons before that, it just. They had won five championship games, you know, before Horan took charge. And after that, they get to, in his eight years in charge, they get to seven All-Ireland semi-finals. You know, there's obviously four All-Ireland final defeats in 12 and 13 and 20 and 21. So we might just get to a little bit of that. So he comes was he, back. Was, and, Tommy, was it was it Holmes and Canelli and then Horn? No, it was James Horn from twenty September 2010 to the end of 2014. Holmes and Canelli come in then for one year. They bring Mayo to an All Ireland semi final, a replay against Dublin. They lose that, played good football that year, and Holmes and Kennelly uh, leave or are, you know, I don't know what the right word is there. Like, leave, leave is about right. Let's there, see. Was, there was a meeting between the players and 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 management yeah. and the county board, and they left anyways. And Stephen Rashford came in then for two years, and we obviously had the epic All Ireland final replay in sixteen, and then the. Can I say even more epic? 2017 final at the Dubs win by a point. 
And then 2018, things don't go to plan. Kildare beat them um, under Rochford in that New Bridge or Nowhere game. And Horan returns then for 2019. So they win a National League title in 2019. And then there's the mad transition where six or seven main Mayo players retire. There's seven debutants given out that that uh, COVID championship in October against Leitrim. And they get to an All-Ireland final, they lose to Dublin. Again in 21, they get back to an All-Ireland final. And this is where things start to go wrong. And we get into that. And there's a quite a good exchange between Paddy Anders and James Horan in the chat. Well worth listening to. And we can have a listen to a snippet here. And it's Paddy asking James about how quickly things turn sour. I couldn't get over it, James. And, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. We, we did a show in th- this season, a live football pod show. And you'd obviously had a, a really, really difficult league final. The, the, the crowd, the Mayo supporters were, were probably not behind. They were questioning the team. They were questioning you, James. What was, what was that like to manage? There seemed to be a disconnect this year between, between the fans, between the media and between the team. Yeah, yeah I look, there's no, no question about it. The last, the, the last couple of seasons have been difficult. I, I think there was lots of stuff Lots of stuff going on, um, you, you know, after the Tyrone defeat, you know, where we beat you guys and we're the world's best and everything is is unbelievable. And we go out, you know, three weeks or whatever later and we don't do it and we're the world's worst. And I, I suppose there was where 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 things were, and maybe we there was you know over time there was so much expectation and everything else that we'd finally beaten Dublin in the championship, and it's only a matter of time, you know. Tyrone were a bad team, you know, that beat Sal Kerry in the semi final, you, you know. So it wasn't we were just going to rock up and, and 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 win it, but but that final definitely changed people's perception. Yeah, that, that was that was a turning point, Tommy, wasn't it? You can kind of tell from James's voice that he knows it as well. Yeah, and it, it's clear listening to the to the t- chat chain that things do change. So um, it was interesting to hear that because we definitely felt that that night in Castle Bear, like we were all a little bit taken back that, God, we didn't realise how bad things were in the county at that time. So um, that's really interesting to hear that. So there's, look, there's loads in the interview. He sat down with us for an hour and, um, you know, there's bits and pieces about growing up in New Zealand and, you know, the influence of the All Blacks and that I've had them and, you know... Uh, a bit of a debate about Mayo's forwards and maybe the lack of scoring forwards. James didn't necessarily agree with some parts of it and other parts he did. Um, and yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot in it. So, we, so that, that question is often posed. Mayo don't have the forwards and they don't have the, the six Killian O'Connors in the team to win in All-Ireland. It's often thrown at them. So Horan disagrees? I don't think six Killian O'Connors <laughs> would work either, Shane. You couldn't well, have six Manzies, fair, could you? Yeah. With six, Someone well, of that you level. You could have six Conor McManus. You maybe, probably yeah. could have six I'd take Conor it, McManus. I'd certainly take it, yeah. Three and a half back line, three and full forward line. <laughs> um, so, like, Horan and Paddy, have, there's a bit of a back and forth between how close Mayo came to beating the dubs. And uh, I won't give you the answer, but the lad's settling on an answer about what went wrong. Mm. Um, but, you know, in Kerry, they, they have an ability to sort of regen their corner forwards and, and produce a Mike Frank Russell and then a Colin Cooper and then a James O'Donoghue throwing a Paul Ganey a Kieran O'Leary a Barry John Kane David Clifford appears they have corner forwards coming out of the woodwork left, right and centre lads that will leave a sit in the bench and come on and kick points regardless and that's always been thrown at Mayo but as James Horan says who is the top scorer in championship football history? <laughs> you know Kieran O'Connor is and they have the footballers. They just can't seem to get them all together at the same time. You know, Tommy Conroy, Ron O'Donoghue having those injuries. Um, and, yeah, like that's, that's, just, that's just where they're at. I'm, um, I'm halfway through, Tommy. I'm saving the uh, second half for later on today. So um, you can spoil it. give me the spoiler if you want. But when, uh, sorry, are we going to uh, see James Horan 3 and when? That, I'm not sure. You'll have to try and pick up on the nuances of his own answer from that. Surely we will. He's still a young man. He's got all this experience in the bank. Like, with any managerial career, right, at that level where it's so intense, 
Mm. They're competing year in, year out. The spotlight, like you said, is on them 24-7. Mm. So there's like, it heightens everything, yeah, right? And, and like, you just don't, you don't see the Brian Cody, Mickey Hart style longevity. It just doesn't happen because of all those factors, I don't think anymore, right? Mm. So what happens is, it comes in, and obviously it's the time for him to go now and let somebody else have a crack at it and let Max Day do what he can do. And then time passes and players change and they develop and they mature and there's a new playing pot and there's a freshness and suddenly it's time to get him back in again. New cycle. I almost feel like, you know when people say, who'd be a manager? Who'd be a GEA manager? Who'd be an intercounty manager today? Well, it's hard to have a... But who'd be the male manager? They're talking about the most pressured job in the country. I know, but, but, but the flip side it's, of that is... Highly sought after, though. It, it is. Well, well you, you, you get the job done... And your statue in the main street in every single town in Mayo is. But if you guaranteed. don't, if you don't, you're the worst in the world. As as James was, that was after that league final. I don't know. I think I actually think that in the in I think that Mayo fans have come to realise over the last four or five years that actually what they've done is amazing. Like I know that I know, I know that in the context of losing an All Ireland final or a semi final or whatever, obviously you couldn't be anything but disappointed. But I think at the cold light of day, they would say they've punched unbelievably well over the last few years. Mm. That was the interesting no, I think, one. I think I think you're. I think there's definitely a cohort, one thousand percent, and and usually, uh, you know, it's it's those who protest who are possibly louder than others. But there was a feeling this year that it just things weren't right, and I don't know whether it was accumulation of stuff, and you you kind of get that sense from listening to the interview that perhaps there was a couple of different factors that that played into that. But like Mayo, there's no doubt about it. They are absolutely um, maniacal about their football. They are mad about it. They love it. And the intensity of interest in the games and there means that it's just there's an extra added pressure to that job. And like, what is success? And I know that's a bit of a rhetorical question. Oh, I agree. They just haven't, you know, they I, I, haven't done it. Yeah, like, but like, you can't be absolutist, I don't think, in, a, in, kind of titles. in the GA. I don't think you can be absolutist because, like, otherwise everything else is just a disaster if you don't win it. Think of the. Think of the journey all those Mayo fans have been on for the last 12 years. Amazing. Imagine oh, all the people that have been brought together. Imagine the people that have come home, that have been away, that come home to watch matches. Like, there is something else going on here. And maybe, I don't know whether they've lost sight of that a little bit, and they're just sick of it, and they see Galway rocking up once every so often, and mm -hmm. out of nowhere, getting to an All-Ireland final and nearly getting the job done, or back in 98, actually going and doing it. I think so, if they could bank one. Oh, do you that's... know what I mean? <laughs> then, then, just then they once. can appreciate exactly, the rest. to win just once. I think. Do you know what they could? I do think that. But like, yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying about the journey. If like, as a Monaghan fan, if I had been on the journey, Mayo fans have been on. I'd, I'd be delighted. Yeah. What a journey! Yeah. But I don't you've know a, if I don't you've know if Mayo a fans. Decade. It was a decent decade, but I don't know if Mayo fans look at it like that anymore. They're like, how, how many times can you drive east to Croker, to Croker and drive west, gutted? I, like you, you, there's only one. Yeah, but only on, on, that on the day that. you're you're gutted, you're totally disappointed. But I think in the round, I take Tommy's point entirely. That I think in the round they're like, "Geez, this is unbelievable! This is an unbelievable train ride to be on." There's almost there's almost enough. no other county in the country that's on this train. But they need the train yeah. to pull into paradise at some point. And they do. No, I, I mean, that, yeah. I don't know. I, I almost feel like you, Tommy. You're, you're obviously when you list off like your college titles and national leagues and all that's great, but. I, there's only one trophy that matters now for Mayo, surely. The well, National League. <laughs> the National League, yeah. They got that National League, they got their hands on it. Yeah, look, time will tell Shane whether, you know, we'll, we'll get an answer to that this year or whether Kevin McStay can be the man to get them over the line. But do, you, do, you think, do, just, do you think he is? I haven't started doing my power rankings yet for next year. <laughs> Go on, give us a quick, quick, quick fire top three or four there. I can't even we, remember. As we sit, come on. I can't even remember the, the amount of counties in the country at the minute. Um, Take a pick between Dublin, Kerry, Mayo. Give us an order there. I mean, maybe Mayo, Mayo aren't even third. Well, like, Sean O'Shea's free changes everything. Mm. Kerry are now on the cusp of, you know, becoming a great side. That's that's what we have in our hands here. Like, they have got the monkey off their back. They've got number one with such a young profile of a team. They're going to be hungry to come back and do it again. They're on their team holiday, I think, next week. Mm. Um, the dubs are back, of course. The dubs will be back. You'd imagine there'll be a couple of counties in Ulster coming back with a vengeance. You know, will Tyrone be back? Will Armagh be back to prove that they're much more than everyone's second favourite team, mm. that they they actually have something in them? Mayo you know, could have be slipped. Well. You're, you're making a case here for Mayo. Hardly been in the top ten. Under the radar. Lads, go where the All-Ireland runners-up. Yeah. Mayo, Mayo have lost possibly their... 
their most explosive player too in, in Ushin Mullen. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be a very interesting year. The, the one thing about next year, lads, the intercounty season, especially in football, is going to be absolutely bananas between Talchon Cup and All Ireland Championship. There's going to be an insane amount of games. It's going to be like a uh, bloody World Cup for six months. <laughs> and I'm putting it that to you. And you, you won't realise till May, and you'll be like, Jesus, Tommy was right. Yeah, and because we'll play this clip back. Cut, Bring uh, back the club. Before Bring we move on from the the um, James Horn interview, Tommy, uh, a fascinating one, and obviously people can can uh, watch and listen back to the, the whole thing to get all the insight. But he's a really interesting background as well, James. Like raised in New Zealand. Yeah, there's there's we get into all of that. Like I, I kind of heard snippets of that before, but never heard him really talk about it in depth. Yeah. Um, you know, th- that's interesting, Shane. I'm not going to give that away. Of course, so you can listen back to that. Um, and uh, you know, we ask him, does he want to get back into coaching? And he does. Basketball. He wants to coach right. and raise basketball. So maybe, Adrian, that answers your question about whether he will come back someday. Because, um, you know, he said the tank was empty back in 2014. You'd imagine how many years did it take to refuel the tank then? Is he talking about, like, the kids basketball or getting involved at a kids, level? Kids basketball at the yeah. minute. But you never know. He, he can work himself back up. We'll see. He'll definitely be back in. There's absolutely no question about it. He could end, even end up going off doing another gig somewhere else, couldn't he? And, no, he flat out refused to well, manage another county. Andy so. McIntyre was saying the same to us when he was in studio. There's no point listening to the interview now. I've given it all away. <laughs> That's the, How no, can people, no. uh, genuinely tell me, the, so the podcast is up and the YouTube is due to be up today. Is that the, the schedule? Yeah, yeah. So the, the podcast is there. So go Dropping. search for the football pod. Um, and if you haven't subscribed already, do, because we'll be back in early January with our 2023 season. So you can get it in the football pod feed or you can get it in OTB GA where you'll get all the other good stuff from off the ball. Um, all our other GA so just search for that and you'll find it and it's well worth a listen while we have you Tommy um, bit of a mad weekend in the club football championship last weekend and yes. some some shocking results and surprise results which we love to see a bit like the World Cup yes. as you said um, what stood out for you? yeah a cracking weekend of football um, myself and Will O'Callaghan I think are going to be power ranking the eight teams that are left and looking at the provincial finals tomorrow on the club championship show so a um, couple of things like you, you had Ian Corbett on there Finally, we have a Newcastle fairy tale that can we, we can all get behind without feeling morally corrupt. Like it's brilliant to see that. Um, what a win! They had an unbelievable win. Like I would have had Clonmel commercials as possibly my third favourites. You know, for the All Ireland title, you would have had either Kilku or Glenn. You would have had Kilmacud Croaks or the Downs, and then you know I would have had Clonmel up there. You know, Mike Cullen are obviously very strong in Galway too. So very interesting couple of weeks ahead in the provincial championships. Newcastle West are up against Cairns and Rally. So first one was the, the Limerick Football Fairy Tale. Number two is the crazy club commitments that are paying off lads. And um I'm starting to feel a bit of Catholic guilt at the, about this at the minute. But like Peter Cook flying home this weekend for Mike Cullen. He's over in New York at the minute. Cairns O'Reilly brought Gavin O'Brien home from New York. He kicked a couple of points. And Jack Savage and Cormac Coffey came back from Dubai and they've been moving back and forth over the last couple of months. They contributed seven points of Cairns O'Reilly's 1-9. So, the Strand Road, uh, they got their money's worth of the lads this week. So, that was something else. And then, up in Ulster, we have a, a heavyweight clash that is the one we're looking for. Cargan were so close to pulling off an upset against Glenn. They pushed Maliki Rourke's side all the way. Kilku, their form has, once they've emerged out of down, has once again become imperious. So, that is going to be a cracking final as well in Ulster. So, look, they're... There were the moments that stood out. You know, I, I know Corbett mentioned the sold out Fossa Castle Mahan game. That was pretty good to see a, a monster email coming through on Saturday morning. Don't go to this game. No tickets left. So when that's happening, it just shows you the health of the club championships up and down the country. Just one more while, while you're on that, like the Kilku one, like Kilku demolished Derry Gunley, I think it was in the in the Ulster club final. Enniskill and Gales. Sorry. Oh, sorry, last year, last year. Last yeah, year. yeah, yeah, Wasn't yeah. yeah. And, and and like I, I look at this Glen team and. What well, Malachy Rourke, look, I'm a Malachy Rourke super fan anyway, given what he's done with modern football. But, uh, like, he took over Glenn, who had never won a Derry Senior Championship. I stand corrected on that. And, and he wins it. Uh, wins it again this year. Uh, like, that that Glenn team, I, I cannot wait for this Ulster final. Because Kilku have been fairly dominant again in Ulster this year in terms of the the uh, the results. Uh, I know they beat uh, Jerome Johnston's Bally Bay, of course, which was a bit controversial as well, and Jerome stepping aside for that game. But Glenn, if they can beat Kilku this weekend, can can definitely mount an All Ireland push. Oh, the winners in Ulster are absolutely in the mix, and 
like you have to look at the last year's final, Kilmco Cross and Kilku. It's hard to look beyond the two of them in terms of how strong they were last year and the credentials they've illustrated so far. But they'll both have a, a tough challenge with the Downs and Lair Wall um, over them in, in, in Leinster and then Kilku and Glen. You're right, Shane. Maliki Rourke feels like he's been the secret sauce over in Glen. They had unbelievable underage teams. They were coming. They were knocking on the door. They were having titanic battles with Schlock Neal and they just weren't getting over the line. Two things happened. Maliki Rourke took over. Connor Glass came home. And you saw the performance of Connor Glass at the weekend. I don't know if you saw the highlights last night. Last night, lads, but um, he, he took a, a serious amount of abuse, kicked at a couple of unbelievable points, and he's just his year has just gone from strength to strength. It's been so impressive. Um, so that is going to be a cracking game of football. Um, it's going to be fireworks. The I love the Leinster decision, which looks like they're going to flip the order of the games um, on Sunday. You are conflicted. I'm the not that conflicted. Folks, I'm not that conflicted. I mean, sorry, surely you're, maybe, you're maybe, rooting yeah. for. I was just delighted. For uh, well, the I, there was no conflict <laughs> when when the Downs were playing Rat so I can tell you that, Tommy. I was delighted to see any West Mead team get one over on uh, on the Mead boys. Who are you going for? And great stuff. Um, like I, I am probably going for Crocs. To be fair, they are. They are. Uh, I'm down there. Um, down there every week. That's it's not like I've no connection to the Downs at all, other than their uh, county team. Mind so, letting go like, of your own county. No, it's not. But it's not. This, you would like if it was. An, if it was. If you were. If you joined a Dublin club. Well, I play. I, I'm. I'm I'm living in Smithfield now, but if Scotts Town or Bally Bay, who aren't my club in Monaghan, were playing the local club there, I'd, I'd go for the Monaghan. No, but not if you were involved in the club. So I'm a proud if you're Monaghan involved man. in the local club, that's that's. that's don't uh, Shane, be throwing red herrings at me. That's, I uh, think Adrian could have a point. I think <laughs> deep down, if your neighbours had beaten you in a county final, and they were going into the provincial final, you turn up, you turn up in in support, but you know secretly you'd be going, Jesus Christ. Hope no, because you, <laughs> exactly. you want to do it. You want to like, get the job. It, it's not like, and also the downs are not like. If it was Gary Castle or Lomans, I would have no. I'd give you an answer straight away. I'd be on the Crokes bandwagon. There'd be no bother to me. <laughs> but uh, the downs are kind of not like that. But I know. Look, you have to turn up. Come here. The, they looks like they're going to um, flip the order to make room for Brian Chee, which I think is a great decision. Who will probably yeah. play the full hurling match and then maybe come off the bench with the full. I think it's brilliant and it's uniquely GA and absolutely when when the the uh, cap needs to be doffed, let's do it. But on the football side, Tommy, what what is your expectation here? Like, the the only thought that I'm having about it is that like the 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 conversations that happened about Crokes being, um, you know, the Man City of GA are just such nonsense when you look at how tight most of the games that they've played over the last couple of years have been. But not the Port Arlington game, uh, in the last round where they put up a bit of a big score. Is that a point or two? something to come for Crokes that there's a bit more cohesion that they could start to rack up bigger scores or a bit of one-off and it could be tied against the Downs I think I think it will be tighter than the Port Arlington game and I, I think I think the Downs the Downs are in bonus territory in ways but they are going to be going for this like when you say chemical Crokes only win games by a point or two a good chunk of that is because of their style of play and the manner in which they set up the Dublin Championship is always going to be uh, very, very tight. But like similar to how Kilku got on, they only edged over the line and they let loose a little bit when they got into the Provincial Series. Um, it's hard to call what that's going to be like, Adrian. Like mm. The downs are going to be so well set up. They've got a super boss in charge, Larwall, who was over Gail Collin killing Mead for eight years. Very nearly got them over the line in Mead. Brought them from a essentially an intermediate club to being on the cusp of winning a senior championship. So, um, they're going to be well set up. It's going to be a good game. It's hard to look past Crokes. When you've got two lads like Rory Carroll and Craig Diaz as your rock, as your core, and then you've got, you throw in Shane Walsh and the, the numerous other Crokes forwards, the numerous other Crokes players that have been on the cusp of the Dublin panel and, and possibly just haven't made it. You've got such a strong inter-county cohort there. So, um, they are a bit of a super club, but I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm, but I'm not saying that in a bad way. They are. They're, they're in a very impressive outfit. It's not, it shouldn't be taken in a negative No, but it's not meant. To, the word super club is never meant as a compliment. Oh, they're a super club. They're a mighty club. Super, comma, club. <laughs> mighty. Okay. Shane is mighty the They're a mighty club. I'll take that. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Tommy, great stuff this morning. Thanks a million. Thanks, lads. Matt Cheers. Tommy. Talk soon. Tommy Rooney of the Football Pod, of course. And as uh, Tommy said, the, the exclusive James Horan interview, you can get it in the podcast wherever you get your podcasts and on the YouTube channel as well. Time to say a very good morning at 8.58 a.m. on this Tuesday morning to John Duggan. Morning, John. Shane and Adrian, how's the form, lads? Keep it well. We've got a, we've got a message in here. Um, can we all just stop this anti-English bias and grow up as a country and support them? 
I actually agree with that. I think I think there's there's too much of it <laughs> that we on on days where they're playing different teams, we don't actually take it seriously, <laughs> and we focus too much on the on the rivalries with other countries. I think we should support our English. We're only over the water, Adrian and, and John. I've actually got a pair of socks with me today. I don't know if I can stretch. Colin was asking me before the show. Watch the hammies there now. This could leg up. I don't know. Yeah. So we've got the. Got Welsh, Welsh socks. Welsh well, socks. we might leave it there. I don't know if there's anything. You else. look like something out of the Stone Roses. Shane. I do actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, uh, I just wanted to get give the bucket hat. But are Wales fools gold? That's the question. Well, they're really. they're pretty much gone, essentially, aren't they, John? It's it's like a. It's all over. It's all over. I think it's, it's all over. It's nice to be there. It's great to be there for Wales, but no, it's all over for them. England will. They're they're very reliant on a player who's been in semi-retirement for a couple of years yeah he's uh, enjoyed his golf the <laughs> last golf. years and look he's a very committed Welsh man and it was a Spurs legend but um, I'm more interested in what England do this evening to be honest is he going to play Phil Foden because mm. Phil Foden is the best player in that England squad and I, I can't really get my head around the fact that he hasn't played him you got. You have to assume that. So he's having. He must be having conversation with Phil Foden behind the scenes right like they're not sort of walking past each other in the corridor and like you know, nod and a wink and on they go. There must there has to be conversations there. And you have to assume that some of that is, listen, you are part of my plans. Here's what I'm going to do with you. Like, Gareth Southgate is planning, unlike how we would be looking at a tournament, mm. which is, can we just get past the group stages and <laughs> see what happens? Yeah. He's planning to get to the final. So, I mean, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be that surprised to see um, Foden play a big part tonight, for example. There's a comment in from, from Cal Doherty on that, on the YouTube lads. Is there a world where Foden gets continually left out and by the time they actually need him, It'll be such a clutch moment that you can't expect to put that much pressure on him. Well, Gareth Southgate's talking about people putting pressure on him, but he's putting pressure on him by not playing him, <laughs> in, in a way, in, in my opinion. Mm. And, uh, th- look, I do think the group stage can be overrated because uh, you've had teams before, like Italy in 82, not play well in a group stage and win the World Cup, and you've had other teams that have been sensational and not won, like the Dutch in 74. Even Italy in 1990 didn't concede a goal until the semi-final. They got beaten on penalties. So um, it is a long tournament. It's hard to win it. Uh, not every team goes through it, like Brazil in 1970 or Brazil even in 2002. Uh, so I, I'm, I wouldn't be too hung up about it if he, if England just get through it in a perfunctory manner. But you're, you you got to start building momentum in the last 16. And um, to me, uh, the performance against uh, USA was worrying, um, and also. You'd have to think, on the basis of what we've seen so far, folks, that Brazil, France, Spain, Portugal are probably ahead of them at the moment. And in some ways, no matter what happens tonight, right? Like, Wales are not one of the elite nations. No. So if they beat them 4-0, it'll be like, well, they're kind of crap anyway. And if it's close, I mean, England are going through either way. So what sort of an impact does that have on... Like, it's very it's very hard to make any conclusions even post tonight. It'll like really only be the last 16 before we get a proper true. sense. See, everyone's so fickle. It's game by game. Like if England, I think if England do win four 0 tonight and play really well, all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, "Well, the England fans will be, yeah, yeah." And the media, of course, like, yeah. but uh, all it takes is one performance. Like after the Iran game, everyone's like, "This is a really exciting team." I know it's only Iran, uh, with all due respect to Iran, uh, but England played so well, mm-hmm. and the USA game was a bit disappointing. Like I know it's it's as we've been saying this morning, France potentially in the quarter final. You, you need momentum to get going in a, in a tournament. So England got momentum at the last year by beating Germany. And they'll need to, well, Ecuador, I, th- I think, are bloody good. Mm. And uh, if Ecuador play England in the last 16, that won't be straightforward. But if they do end up meeting France, they're need to going to take a scalp of a, of a France. Um, and it, it looks like it could be Portugal, Croatia at that side of the draw as well. At the moment, it's looking potentially like Spain, Brazil in the quarters and Argentina, Netherlands. But there will be shocks along the way. Brazil... John, you you kind of tip, did you tip Brazil before the tournament? Richardson certainly was your top goal scorer. No, Brazil were I, I, I classified them as bankers. Yeah, which is the kind of thing I would. Do you say. stand by that? Well, you see, it's always they always do that kind of thing because if it if it ever does come to pass that I can go and play the tape on Twitter and so like, you, know, you know how <laughs> rerun the phone. You know you know how uh, certain I was of this thing that actually then did happen, but um, I was very impressed with them defensively. They haven't conceded a shot on target in their opening two games. And they're able to go into another gear um, because they haven't played that well in the first half of their two matches, but they're able to up it a, a, a gear or two. And uh, I thought we, see, we saw that yesterday against a very organised Swiss team. So, But once again, it's hard to win World Cups. They could end up in a penalty shootout with Spain and get knocked out in the quarterfinals or lose to Ghana on penalties in the, in the last 16. You don't know, but I wouldn't be swapping my bet for anybody else at this stage. First team in Brazil to go 17 games unbeaten in the World Cup group stage, which is quite remarkable when you think about it as well. Norway, the last team to beat them in 1998. There you go. Like, um, 
you might just quickly bring us up to date, John, on, on what's happening in the World Cup today. Uh, well, as I said, Wales have to win against England at 7 o'clock and the other game of that group is really the one I think a lot of us will be watching USA-Iran a lot of controversy before the match with Carlos Quiroz uh, talking about um, gun violence in America and then the Iranian journalists being quite uh, hostile almost to Tyler Adams in their line of questioning I don't think it was a great decision for the USA to remove the Islamic emblem from the uh, Iranian flag in a, in a tweet there which they subsequently took down and uh, their manager apologised for it yesterday because that's just going to fan the flames. Um, but that'll be a fascinating game and Iran are a point ahead of the USA at the moment in that group. So that's Group B, 7 o'clock matches. The other game's 3 o'clock, we finished the 10 o'clock matches. So uh, the Netherlands, because of that 2-0 win over Senegal, with Qatar out of the competition, you'd have to think they're probably going to top the group and Ecuador just need a draw against Senegal to go through as well as that's what's going on today. Um, apart from that, Robbie Henshaw out to the new year with a wrist injury. And uh, that's disappointing for him. Racing the punches town today, 11.45. Uh, Tiger Woods out of his own tournament this week, the Hero World Challenge. He's got a foot injury, but it's all about Qatar. And obviously we saw that protester last night. Mm. Um, and, and there's a huge geopolitical element to this, which isn't going away. So I don't know what you lads have made of the tournament so far, whether you've enjoyed it or not, but... Um, I think it's quite an open World Cup. Yeah, I've I've I've, I've enjoyed the football. Um, obviously, there's there is the dark cloud that hangs over it all, and you kind of feel guilty every time you you sit there and enjoy it because you remember what's what's happening behind the scenes here. Um, but we're at the halfway point now in terms of in terms of football matches played. So I think we're starting to see. I think after two group games, we we said we'll we'll start to see a shape develop, uh, and teams come through. But I mean. Teams can start to emerge. When we get to the last 16 in the quarterfinals and penalty shootouts start happening and there's a little bit of jeopardy and big teams are getting knocked out, that's when the real excitement starts, I think, football-wise. John, you've been, you've been busy, though, because you've been picking your, your best World Cup eleven of your lifetime. So I, don't, this, this, I don't think it's my lifetime. It, sorry, it's not your lifetime. Um, and maybe I need to do my lifetime one because I wouldn't have seen some of these players play. Um, so I'm going off like footage and... Uh, reading and, and history and, and generally what the consensus is. But it's a bit of crack. The BBC were doing it and I decided to just lob it up there on Twitter yesterday and, and people have their own reaction. There's no right or wrong answer to this, lads. So so it's it's players that have played in a World Cup Finals? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and performed at a World Cup Finals. Like Paolo Maldini is one of the best left backs that's ever been, but did he really have an impact on the World Cup? No. Lionel Messi's not in my team because he hasn't really had a huge impact on the World Cup to dislodge, say, Pele or Maradona or... Um, so what's your 11? Ronaldo Nazario. So um, I will go through it here if I have it on my tweet. Um, excuse me for one second. No problem. It's, um, um, is, this is like a, the countdown music, isn't it? Or, a bit of elevator or, music or, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or kind of like a drum roll or something Speaking like that. Speaking of Jeopardy, we've got yeah, Jeopardy yeah, right here yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So here we go. Okay. So Levi Ashton in goal. Um, Carlos Alberto of Brazil, 1970, right back. Uh, Gatano Shirea of Italy, 1982, and Franz Beckenbauer, my uh, my centre backs. Actually, going to go for because John Brennan from the Sunday World who pointed this out, and I kind of agree with him. I'm probably going to go for Paul Breitner at left back over Roberto Carlos, but it's a tough one. Then uh, Lothar Mateus as the holder. Um, in the you need one of those types of players in the middle of the park with Zinedine Zidane, uh, Juan Cruyff, Maradona, Pele, and Ros Ronaldo Nazario, the original Ronaldo, the phenomenon. Hard to argue. That's my team. The only probably the only change I would make is Beckenbauer out and Gary Breen in <laughs> potentially for that. Uh, for We'd that all be having that. Adrian, do you have anything ball? there? That you, ah, no. Listen, it's it's of such a um, the the lifetime one or tournaments attended one. I think would be an yeah, interesting yeah, one to do. Yeah. But it's just you'd spend <laughs> you'd take two weeks off, Jenny, to <laughs> sit down and do Still it, leave people out. because like I think that. I think what you've done the right thing there, which is like the temptation is just to go with the biggest names and lash them in. But actually, what sort of impact did they have when they played at World Cups is yeah. probably the better yeah. question. Yeah, Vava, Garincha, you've all these players that have had huge impacts that were Paolo Rossi, um, Zico, you know, you, even back to the 1930s. And then they like start to look at the likes of a, a Scalacci who had well, not much of a career outside of that, but like an unbelievable World Cup. Yeah, and, and very rare that he won both the golden boot and the golden ball. Mm. So he won both the top scorer and the player of the tournament. Uh, Incredible achievement. In, in 1990, um, which is quite well documented on that Italian 90 documentary that Sky have done. They interview him and his father, it's quite nice. Um, I can't get enough of it, lads. I can't get enough of the nostalgia. Mm. Um, there's even a podcast apparently at the moment that's doing Every Day of Spain 82. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So it's the, the FIFA Uncovered is very, very good if anybody wants to watch that. It's a great accompaniment to the World Cup. I, that's a slightly odd thing to say, but I've been watching it sort of ep, an episode every every other day or every couple yeah, of days. Yeah, yeah. And it's great just to remind yourself yeah. of all the other yeah. stuff that's going on. What, was, yeah. what were your first World Cups? In terms of definitely remembering and following. Oh, 80, 86, Maradona. Same, yeah, same. Maradona, 86. Yeah. Um, and I had... Um, Do you have the, the sticker book? And yeah, the, sticker uh, book. I was just yeah. going to say that, yeah. Didn't fill it now, oh, yeah. but um, it was I'd my love to. I'd love to... F- I saw uh, Mick O'Keefe, a uh, friend of the show, former Dublin footballer, yeah. uh, on Twitter the other day. Former his, schoolmate of mine, his, by the way. Really? No way. Yes. Had, his, uh, had his binder out. And uh, just a flood of memories. I'd love to be able to find, uh, <laughs> find the one that I had. It was... I had a FIFA 98. There one. were loose pages that you'd turn over. Like, you know the production that you get now of, like, this amazing book that was, yeah. like, you know, that would, is going to last a thousand years. This was, like, um, a ring binder. Wasn't it? And you flip the pages over and then you... you uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Was, I think yeah. the only sticker book I ever found, I don't know if it's behind there somewhere, I had a Premier League 04 or something sticker book that I managed to complete in its entirety, which was no mean feat. Did you, you, have, to, did you have to send away for the last ten or anything? I think I might have had did to... Steal steal or dupe made sort of... The pa- I think the parents were... Uh, went through a lot of money probably right. buying stickers. <laughs> okay. And then you're in school with the with the elastic band around them and you're swapping, <laughs> swap, keep, swap, keep. Class. Just like trying to trying to find out which ones you have, and which ones you don't. Um, but the World Cup albums were unbelievable. Like, yeah, you, you nearly remember some names because of the World Cup teams. Well, it's a great education for anybody, any young lad or any young girl who wants to get into. And hopefully, the Women's World Cup they're going to have them next year. Mm. There is uh, talk about Panini doing that, yeah. Th- yeah. I think Phil's book is somewhere behind me. Is it here? Phil's nineteen ninety book. That's there, it up there. You, yeah. yeah, I, I would I would grab it, but I'd end up <laughs> I'd end up knocking the cup. I know for a fact. Uh, like though, but those World Cup books are just like I'm sure there's kids right now who've the sticker books for guitar. It costs about eight hundred quid to a grand to fill them. <laughs> Is it? Is that right? Yeah. Um. And so I didn't fill eighty six, but I, I just uh, and then I kind of cheekily I shouldn't have done this, but I got into trouble for it. I went up the following season to get bread and milk, and I bought a, a Daily Mirror sticker pack, um, for the eighty six eighty seven season, and then that kind of steamrolled from there. I filled Panini eighty nine. I had to send away for the, the, uh, the thing that I so there's like the match attacks are the are the thing now I don't like know. for kids and they're like right. accumulating these for the for for European for club football and um, my young fella's like not even six and he's mad obsessed with them, but they're fairly confusing because it used to be just you get the sticker card and maybe there was like a captain card or maybe there was like a most valuable player card mm. type thing. They have a card for everything now. It's the shiny like, ones, the shiny gold ones. Yeah, are, or hat, the hat trick hero. They have like it's too oh, many. It sounds like the top trumps for the just uh, gonna say current top generation. Trumps. That was brilliant. Um, there was the cowboy one. I really liked the cowboy one. Wyatt Earp or Jesse James. Um, and then there was trucks uh, and cars. There was. Um, yeah, Top Trumps Jesus, was good fun. Top Trumps, John, I'm after getting just a wave of nostalgia. That's a, yeah, that's yeah. a trend I can get behind. But the football Top Trumps were, that's an easy win. You can probably, I'm, I'm sure they're still, I'm sure they're still, there's only, only Fields and Horses Top Trumps. Is there? Notorious Serial Killers Top Trumps. There's Guinness World Records. Cricket, Peaky Blinders. There's top trumps for everything. Top trumps. <laughs> I mean, like what the hell? <laughs> There's something for everyone. Um, um, yeah, madness. Yeah, '86 was the first one. I, I mean, it, it, it really illuminated my childhood because uh, you know Ireland was really, really in a bad place at the time, and uh, you're getting you know small TV and the, these like mm. beautiful images of Mexico and this like sunny place and being beamed into your living room like it was just incredible. And then Italian '90 happened and. That's what the World Cup's been all about. But the Spain World Cup in '82, for anybody looking at the footage, you just there was so many dramatic points that tournament. And uh, if it does go there in 2030, it'll be it'll be definitely good. It's a good place to host the tournament. I think a lot of people my age will be. 2002 was the one where you had the TV being rolled into the classroom. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Robbie Keane's the wheels. moment. And yeah, yeah. I, I remember distinctly. I can't remember exactly what time the England Brazil quarter final kicked off, or was it last 16? Um, but I remember it was like. It was clashing with the start of school, or the first hour of school, and uh, we weren't. We were told the day before, no, the TV's not being rolled out for the England-Brazil game. But I was thinking, I have to watch this game. This is going to be a cracker. So I, I stayed at home. Myself and one other lad in the class stayed at home, watched the game, came in late. That like everyone jealous. I remember walking in like a king in the classroom <laughs> at about at the wee break. And the teacher's not like what? Teacher's like, where were you? And I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I mean, wasn't feeling great. Was. I'm fine now. Yeah, yeah, I was honest with them. I think I was watching the match. Come on. So they understood. It was the World Cup. I mean, uh, parent teacher made me fun after that. Yeah, well, this is it. I mean, but but you can't miss those. I don't. Regret, I don't regret that whatsoever. But that that moment where the TV was rolled in for the Germany game and and the whole classroom went buck mad for for the equalising goal from. Robbie I missed King. the goal. I was recording a bulletin on today. If any the time. <laughs> I was watching it in a pub in, that I was working in in New Zealand. And yeah, it was, it's uh, amazing it was what like people's life stories and you know and you're what nine or ten chain you know. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, that's why. That's why I guess that's the awkward thing about this World Cup is that kids who are nine or ten don't care and don't know about the 
the background story until they're older they won't know the I guess the, the filth behind this World Cup and why it's in this country and why it shouldn't have been in this country it's outrageous the, even the time of the year that it's at these kids have missed the World Cup yeah. because they're in school you know well that never like, came to me yeah yeah that's a fair point um, and like I they're don't, getting to see the evening games and that's it ah they are and they'll see the weekend matches and stuff like that but it's like I don't know even in our house I don't feel like our younger kids are our two younger kids are match crazy they'll go to anything They'll whatever's going they want to go to it but I'm not really talking to them too much about the World Cup for yeah. the reasons that you've just outlined I think it's yeah it's a fair point uh, John great stuff as always alright guys you. thank you 40 minutes past nine, just time to bring it. There's one other story that's uh, kind of emerged in the last uh, number of minutes. Matteo Bonato, the uh, Ferrari team principal in Formula One, has resigned after their failed title bid this year. He's been at the helm of Ferrari since 2019. Uh, promising start, of course, to this uh, 2022 season, but failed to claim a win in the final 11 races of the campaigns. We'll leave the role on New Year's Eve. No real surprise. Uh, Ferrari had an absolute mare. Uh, you had Charlotte Clare and Carlos Sainz, who are two of the best drivers in the grid. Um, but a lot of per... Uh, Per team tactical choices, uh, per pit stops, and just issues with the team itself uh, that caused the clearance signs. Or pit to, to stops, as in they took too long, or they were too long, bad and, calls. and almost sometimes making the wrong call to bring the car into the pit. Enough, yeah. So uh, I think. Uh, and is that rest solely with him, or is that like a? Oh, well, he's team principal. I suppose it's it's. I mean, buck stops with the, hit, the, like. the top guy. So I mean, look, it's not just him. There's of course engineers and chief engineers below him that are probably <laughs> culpable as well. But I mean, for a team like Ferrari to with a car as fast as it should have been this year uh, and everyone before the before the year was like oh, this is the car that's going to challenge Max Verstappen Hamilton's kind of gone but I mean I, I think he had to resign to his hair will be missed from the grid it will and from Drive to Survive he was Super one of those hair. for anyone who is unfamiliar he was the guy with glasses and the curly black hair uh, lovely Italian accent so uh, yeah Matteo Bonato gone there's one other bit of news there I see Jurgen Klinsmann has apologised uh, sorry I see Jurgen your, your Klinsmann has issued a statement in relation to the comments he made that people will be familiar with um, when he was on the BBC, I think it was, yeah. um, around the Wales Rand game. He says, My comments on the Wales v Iran game were purely football related. I was talking about their culture. He says, Unfortunately, this was taken out of a footballing context. I have many Iranian friends and was always full of compliments for their people, culture, and history. I wish them only the best for the tournament. I have many Iranian friends. I mean, even the. Mm. It's a little bit on the old Tom Deaf side there, but. Strange. Look at, yeah. Yeah, sets up the yeah I guess the USA Iran game. Yeah. Uh, plenty of talking points off and on the pitch for that game this evening. Uh, OTBM at nine sixteen a.m. this morning. Brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Here's what we've got on OTB Sports Radio for you today. From one o'clock, it's OTB Gold. Speaking of Formula One, with Nigel Mansell. Three o'clock, it's Dadcast. From four p.m., we have a career retrospective interview with Paul McShane. Uh, OTB Gold with Jason Sherlock is at six o'clock, and then of course the show is live. From 7 pm this evening with Joe Malloy. You can follow OTB across all our social channels. Subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the very best in the latest sports content. Up next, the Valley Hill Shamrocks and Kenny Hurling star Adrian Mullen will be on the line back after this. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Zebo going on his own, he gets the try. The Red 78. We're both monster people. Nobody knows monster rugby better. Kirby gets over the line. Available every Wednesday. Don't miss a moment of action. Subscribe to the Rugby Channel on the OTB Sports app and turn on your notifications now. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prices include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. 18 minutes past nine on uh, this Tuesday morning's OTB AM. Some other news that's uh, just come in uh, in the last number of moments. Colo Torre has been named the new Wigan Athletic Manager on a three and a half year deal. Surprising enough news. Wow! Yeah, yeah. I didn't know name. he was in the in the mix for that sort of thing. At least they've got their uh, their song uh, ready to go. Anyway, maybe he brings yeah yeah in as uh, his assistant. <laughs> yeah, interesting to see what he does with uh, with James McLean, of course, uh, over at Wigan. Uh, delighted to uh, welcome on the line on this uh, Tuesday morning the uh, Kilkenny and uh, Ballyhill Shamrocks hurler Adrian Mullen. Morning, Adrian. How are things? Good morning, lads. How are you? Keeping well. We're keeping well. Uh, another good win in the the Leinster Club Championship at the weekend against uh, against Nace. A uh, closer game for large swathes of that match than, than a lot of people expected, I guess. Adrian and Nace made a mockery of those nine to eleven odds pre-match. Yeah, exactly. Um, nine know, to one, a, I should say. 
Yeah, um, I suppose in the first half, um, you know, uh, there was periods there where they were well on top of us. And, um, you know, they could have uh, banged in a few goals there in the first, I'd say, 10 minutes. But, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, Dean Mason was on top of his game. like So he, he, kept, he kept them out. But, uh, yeah, no, it was very very tough uh, first half. And um, I suppose we just pulled away then in the second half. I suppose, you, was it strength and depth? Was it maybe the the extra layers of fitness you've, you have going into this year that kind of helped you push on in the second half or, or a combination of a few things? Um, yeah, no, i say it was a combination of a few things, um, you know, because we went, we obviously went in at halftime, I think, was it level or we were a pint up and, um, you know, we, we weren't playing well at all. So I think at halftime we probably corrected a few things and um, went out in the second half and, you know, I suppose we, we probably hurled a bit more to our potential like in the second half um, and you know kept kept taking over the points and then obviously the the goals came with um, Owen Cody and, and Joey Cody as well so that gave us a, a right boost. So you're five in a row with Kenny Senior Hurling Champions, you're going for five in a row Leinster titles, you'll of course face uh, Kilnacoe Crokes as we've been uh, speaking about already this morning on, on, on the show in the uh, the Leinster Decider. Uh, like, how do you keep motivated year on year Adrian when, you, when, you're, when you're so dominant complacency is always at risk I guess for with any team of setting in but are there ways in which you manage to, to kind of sit down at the start of the start of the year and and get rid of any potential remnants of complacency um well I suppose a lot of that is down to the management as well you know they they kind of keep us hungry um and they, they obviously don't let the complacency uh, sink in with us like so a huge amount of that is down to the management and obviously we have uh we have I suppose leaders on the team as well who uh who, you know, keep the keep the ball rolling as well, like you know, and you have to probably likes Joy Hall and Colin and TJ who've done it all in the game. And when when you see those lads are, are still as hungry as ever, you know, um, they kind of bring the you know, say the younger lads on on as well, like so. Um, yeah, when we're looking at them and you know they're they're mad to win, um, it kind of feeds into us as well. Amazing the the family links to to your Ballyhill squad. I guess it's no surprise at club level that there's going to be there's going to be families there. Like you, you your cousins are, are Michael and Colin, Colin Fenley as well. So I, I'd imagine from a young age, you're tapping into those lads and and uh, I guess utilizing their experience to to help yourself. Oh, hundred percent, yeah. Um, no, uh, but when I was a young lad, um, I suppose Colin and, and Mick were were winning all Ireland with Ballyhill and Kilkenny, like so. You know, to have have those uh, lads to look up to, and then obviously I got to play with the, play with them as well. Played with Mick for um, a couple of years, and still play with Colin. So um, yeah, those they they were huge uh, for me when I was younger. Um, you know, I I've often said, say nights before all Ireland, they used Colin to the house, and you know, if when you have lads going going up to Crow Park the next day and Colin into your house the night before, like it's it's uh, it's obviously going to drive you on to I suppose um, try be like them as well. So. And that was a huge help. You probably have them in a pedestal as well. Like at a young age, you're looking at them going, well, am I ever going to get to that point? Yeah, um, I suppose that, that that makes you um, become a, be- a better player as well because, you know, when you're thinking, am, am I going to ever do what they do? Um, you know, it really drives you on. Um, and, you know, it really makes you work, work for it as well. Um, and, you know, I think that makes you become a better player looking up to those lads and trying to do what they do. You have the three brothers on the on the Ballyhill team, which is Darren, Patrick, and uh, and Kevin. Where, where do you come in the in the group in terms of age? Um, so yeah, the oldest is Patrick, and then you have Kevin, then you have Darren, then I'm the fourth. So and you have the fourth uh, oldest. The uh, the like positionally, are you all in different areas of the pitch? Were you in the back garden, like playing in different positions growing up, or did you all have uh, have ambitions to be to be uh, banging the ball over the bar? I guess. Um, yeah, no, I suppose you have uh, two back, uh, Kevin and Darren are probably the backs in the family and then uh, Patrick plays midfield, but he's always kind of a forward growing up and then um, I was more of a forward as well, although I played in the backs there when I was younger, but uh, no, I always kind of imagine myself as, as a forward as well, so, um, you know, the, the, the matches in the back garden were interesting back in the day, so. There's no holding back when it comes to sibling rivalries. Like I can speak to that. Um, they, I, I remember the 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 dreaded cruciate, and we were talking about cruciates on the show already this morning. But February 2020 national league game against Clare, um, and and I know even which is quite remarkable. I don't know if there's genetics linked to this. I'm not a scientist, but yeah, your brother Darren suffered 
Crucial uh, injury twice as a teenager. Patrick had a similar setback in, in 20, 2017. So you've all had that um, heartbreak of the SEL. Yeah, uh, it's, it's actually a weird one that I suppose you all did. Uh, but look, I, I don't think it... I don't think it runs in the family. I think maybe we were just uh, unlucky. And, uh, you know, Darren did his when he was 40, did his first one when he was 14 and second one when he was 16. Um, So, you know, for him to come back from from two of those was obviously unbelievable um, uh, work that he he put into it. Like, um, and, you know, I I probably had them to kind of tap into as well when I was doing my my rehab and learn from them as well. So, um, yeah, no fair play to them. Do you get to lean on on sports psychologists when you when you when you have an SEL? Because it strikes me as something that when you're involved in in the the Hellfire Leather Championship with Club Or County, you're it's almost like part of your identity that your whole year has almost been molded around what happens with your club and what and with the county and fixtures. So like, is it is, it must be tough mentally as well as physically to to cope with that? I'm I'm sure you have support systems there to to kind of help you get through those those tough days. Yeah, no, um, it was unbelievably uh, tough mentally. Um, I, I could actually say it was tougher mentally than it was physically. Um, but I probably did my cruise at a bad time. Um, it was during COVID, so you know I had no access to to one on one um psychologists or <clears throat> no even getting into the gym or stuff like that. Like so, um, no, I I, I think. Psychologists, when 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 any player gets injured, I think psychologists would be a huge help to him. But uh, I obviously, I unfortunately didn't have the chance to speak to anyone. And you know, I'd I'd recommend um, for anyone who does get an injury like that to probably you know talk to someone because you know it is it is very mentally tough. Like and um, as I said, it's probably more mentally challenging than it is physically challenging. Um, Adrian, we've uh, been chatting about you a good bit on the show over the last couple of years. Tommy Welsh, when I heard you were coming on, it was a Tommy Welsh comment that jumped out for me when he was on. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it might have been 18 months ago, two years ago, and he was a, a massive fan of yours when you started to sort of come on the radar. And and like just, it struck me, just given the quality of some of the names that we've mentioned already, <coughs> some of them are your relations, and the quality of the players that have come through Kilkenny over the years. Um, have you... Do you take, like, you're still very young in your career, do you take much of an opportunity to chat to some of the greats that have been there? Um, maybe the likes of Henry might be sort of slightly off the radar at the minute, but are there are there any of those players that you've been able to lean on or chat to or watch back? Or, yeah, given, given the lineage of amazing players in your position that have come through Kilkenny? Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I spoke to a few over over the, few, over the years, um, and obviously I got to play with a few, uh, a few of the greats over, mm. the, over the years with... Uh, the club and county like so um yeah you definitely learn off those lads um you know i had uh one year i think i had uh henry dj and uh brian cody over me in the same year so um obviously you're going to learn a, a fair bit off, off those three lads um so yeah no they're they're a huge help what was Henry like to could like could you could you sit with him and go because I know like certain players we talked to Ronan Agar a fair bit at the show and he says he doesn't want to talk to his out halves too much about that specific thing but could you like is he proactive coming up to you giving you pointers are you chasing him up how does that work? Um, well, yeah, I don't want to get into too much about Henry because uh, obviously he's gone elsewhere but uh, yeah no he he was unbelievable and um, no he's he was an unreal manager and a person to have around the club like so. Um, yeah, no, he's class. He's all, he's all, he's all swimming in the WhatsApp group when the, the Shefflin Cody handshake incident happens. Like, I mean, storming a teacup for some people, but I mean, it was one of those moments where I'm sure the players are kind of sitting back going, ah, oh, this is, it's interesting. It adds a bit of spice to the games, I suppose. Yeah, I, I don't think there was much in it, though, to be honest. Um, obviously, for the players looking on, we didn't get in, too much involved in it. Like, so um, I think that was up for the, that was for the kind of media and the, and the, the spectators to kind of talk about, but uh, we didn't get involved in it too much. And you know, I, I'm sure the two, the two, uh, Brian and Henry, um, would say the same that there was there wasn't much in it. Now, to be honest, do you remember when you when you first got that call from from Brian Cody? Because look, it's a, it's the end of an era now when he's when he's no longer in in charge. But when you got that first call from him to to either join the the setup, the training setup, or to to get into the squad fully, like what was what was going through your head? Because I'd imagine that's that's a that's a, that's a big moment in your life. Yeah, um, it's a huge moment, I suppose, because you know, you're always dreaming of, of getting that call. And um, you know, we had a, a good run with uh, the club that year. And uh, 
he, he rang me, I'd say, late December, early January to um, come in when, when the club is over. So, uh, no, that was that was unreal to get that that call, um, and especially off such a such a legend of, of the game as well. Like, um, so yeah, no, I was, I was buzzing when I got that call. Who's the first person you talked to? Um, I think I was, I was actually in the, in the library at, at the time uh, that we had exams, so I was in the library and um, I just got this call. And, uh, you know, I didn't have the number saved or anything, so I uh, didn't know who it was. So I took the call anyway, and sure, all the lads were around me, so. Um, yeah, no, it was a few of the friends there in the library that heard first. Jeez, that's an awful place to get a call like that where you just want to start jumping up and down. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And you, you don't know whether to take it serious at the time either. You don't know if it's uh, if it's lads messing with yeah. you or whatever. So, um, yeah, no, you have to let it sink in for, for a couple of minutes first. Do you celebrate that? Like, it strikes me, if you're a young, young lad and you get called into the team, you want you want to celebrate moments like that. And even, you know, winning an All-Star like this year and stuff. I know the individual gongs and honours probably mean more to you when, when you retire at some point and looking back on your career but it must be nice at the time to to, to get recognised whether it's the call up to the team for the first time or whether it's an all-star um, Yeah no it's obviously it's a you know you, you say it's a team game but obviously these individual awards are, are nice to have as well and um, I think you know in, in, the, at the, in the moment you, you have to enjoy these moments as well like so um, yeah no there are definitely things you know that I'm no I'm happy about and you know, I I do celebrate them, I suppose. TJ Reid, um, I think he's 35 years of age at the minute and, you know, scored 1-6 last weekend in that win over Nace. Uh, same week same week as the uh, birth of his first child, so a big, big week for TJ. But, um, I mean, Adrian, Jesus, he, he just keeps he just keeps performing year on year, doesn't he? He's, he's showing no signs of stopping. Yeah, it's it's actually, it's fairly ridiculous what he's doing, you know. It's, uh, it's unbelievable to look at. Um and I suppose it's it's a credit to him the way he keeps himself so fit and and strong, and you know match ready like um, because to do that at thirty five years of age and you know be the main man for for so many of the games as well like um it's it's unbelievable um I don't, I don't know how he's doing it to be honest but uh yeah no it's it's probably down to um just the shape he keeps himself in and you know he's always just ready to go. I'm always fascinated by these um. Iconic players and and hearing the insights for what they're like in training. I remember listening to some of the Kilmacud lads talking about uh, just Shane Walsh and how ridiculous he's been in training sessions and lobbing keepers and all this sort of stuff. But like, what what's TJ like in training? Um, when when he does train, he, geez, he's on, he's unbelievable. <laughs> and we're, we're we're um, I suppose we probably it's not that we take it for granted, but some of the things he he does in training, uh, we're, we're nearly used to at this stage. So um, I'd say if if anyone else, any outsider was looking on and they seen some things that that he doesn't train, and they, they, you know, they, I'd say they wouldn't be able to believe it. Like, but uh, we're probably so used to it at this stage that when he does something, you know, you nearly expect him to do it. Like, when you're when you're in St Kieran's College, and and like that's such an iconic place steeped in history, and Kenny Hurling as well, um, one of the great schools, and and it's created so many top players, including yourself, but. When you're a kid walking through the wall, the, the hallways, and you're you're seeing photographs of some of the former pupils and and lads who've gone on to win multiple All Irelands, like that must that must be it must be quite a quite a feeling. It, it probably highlights just how much you want to to break through and, and wear the black and amber for the first time. Yeah, um, obviously, so many uh, greats of the game have, have gone through uh, Kieran's College, like so. You know, there's a there's a hall in in Kieran. It's called the Glass Hall, and uh, you know it's it's covered in photographs of uh, former players. And uh, you know, sometimes most of the time you'd nearly be late for class because you're just glued to the walls, uh, looking at all these past players, like and just kind of imagine yourself being up there, like so. Um, you know, I think the probably the culture around Kieran's, um, you know, is huge to the development of the players. How do you have you have you been back? I'm sure you've. Uh... Your own photograph is no doubt on the walls in, in Kieran's now. Have you have you ma- had the chance to get back and speak to, to students at any stage, or, or has that not come around yet? Um, yeah, no, I'm not sure if uh, my photograph is anywhere on the walls yet, but uh, <laughs> hopefully be there someday. Uh, but no, I, I haven't been, you know, in there too much. Um, I, I keep in contact with a few a few of the teachers that were there, all right, but um, no, I haven't got a chance to go in and, t- and talk to the students anyway. Uh, Adrian, finally for me. Um, Limerick and their dominance. Uh, how how do you go about coping with 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 a team of of their strength? Because they've come through 
and created a team now that that's a team of an era and uh, and yet you've got yourselves and other counties breathing down their necks uh, trying to knock them off that that perch but can can you like how do you, how do you how do you line up against uh, Limerick at the moment like do you see weaknesses in 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 the team at all or is it just a case of you know on on your day you have to get everything 100% right in order to beat them yeah no Limerick are a serious outfit and um you know they've they've set the bar so high joined la- in the last few years and it's probably up to the the chase pack um to to reach those levels as well um but look i i, I believe any any day you go onto the hurling pitch um anyone can beat anyone like so um it's all about on the day really and um you know who performs to the to the highest level will usually come out on top and um you know they've obviously been so good the last few years and and it's just up to us to to reach those levels and what about the Croaks game obviously it's like you've sort of proven that you can win it whichever way you want to win it a uh, bit of a slow start obviously the last day and you managed to bat that to one side and, and come back which probably gives you a confidence in another guard as well but uh, Croaks obviously been knocking on the door a little bit over the last couple of years uh, and should be another belter I'm sure you're uh, deep in preparation for them already yeah no um, it'll be extremely tough game um, you know they have forwards there who would make any team in the country, you know. So, um, you know, they have, they're they dangerous in, in their own way. And, um, look, we'll just get ourselves ready over the next week and, uh, you know, we'll analyse them in the next in the next few days. But, uh, you know, we probably have to reach a new level um, because, obviously, the last the last day, the first half wasn't good enough. So, um, you know, we, we can't let that happen to us again because, you know, Kilmacud will blow us out of the water if that happens to us. Adrian, you've been very good with your time. Uh, listen, best of luck in the final against uh, Kilmacud Croaks and thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers, lads. Thanks a million. Christoph. Adrian Mullen there, Ballyhill Shamrocks, and Kilkenny. Uh, 9.35am on this Tuesday morning, 2pm. A few of the comments coming in on the YouTube channel as well. Bob Dwyer saying, great to hear Kilban back on OTB between last night with Joe and this morning with you lads. Seems like one of the nicest men in football. Only when he's not giving you dogs abuse appearances can be deceiving Shane, that, that's what you're about to say there isn't it <laughs> yeah. I know Caban's a lovely man I know Adrian and Kevin have their, have their lovely on-air, on-air battles which I quite enjoy uh, Shifty Lad says Foden wouldn't flourish with the likes of Southgate Trent should play with Kyle Walker right of the three Southgate manages like a defender which is maybe a fair point um, also says the referee for the penalty I think genuinely didn't make his mind up until he walked back over to the box they usually point within a couple of seconds I think that was Bruno Fernandes uh, one we're talking about last night um, yeah, I, I'm I'm interested to see the the England starting team today. Like that's mm. it'll kind of give us a, an indication because there is something to still play for, and they they want to kind of they would have taken this position before the before the tournament. You know, yeah. win and a draw, and you go into the last game knowing a win tops the group. Yeah, like people are ringing the death knell for England after the draw with USA. Ah, it's not going to do It's probably too early for that. I, do, I was interested in coming to you earlier on about sort of the general state of where we're at, and I do think that the teams that we are talking about have been at the top end of it: Brazil, France, Spain. Um, I'm probably missing one or two there, but there's, th- outside of that group, I think that's where your winner's going to come from. Yeah. Like, I don't think there's too many. I don't think England really in the mixer. I think that obviously, I think Henderson comes in today, doesn't he? You think that's yeah. been confirmed almost already? But I think, to be honest with you, no matter. Uh, hopefully he does give Foden a start and we get to look at him and, and, mm. and he can sort of lay down the marker what he's all about and that'd be great. But I think no matter what England team put out, to be honest with you, like unless Bale has suddenly been like hiding his uh, abilities, his 2022 abilities under a bushel. I think no matter what team they put out, they're going to get it done. Yeah, they'll get over the line. You'd imagine uh, the Wales team are just brutal. Although I, I mean, you I are a, you are a adopted Wales man for the moment. You're for a bucket the bucket hat man. I do. Yeah, I'll keep the socks on for the afternoon for the match. Uh, Adrian, great stuff. Sure, we'll, sure. Uh, of course, check back in on Friday when we'll be swapping seats on uh, OTBM. Uh, brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. OTBM back tomorrow morning with Jeremy myself in studio. Brent Pope joins us to select the best fifteen players he played against. News Talks Courts correspondent Frank Rainey will provide an update on the Regency trial. We'll, of course, have the latest on the World Cup, plus much more besides. Right now, we're leaving you with Dan McDonald's. You had to be there. Enjoy and see you tomorrow. Good luck. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movin.